Good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and greetings as well to those who are watching uh, the event online. My name is Jim Capretta. I'm a resident fellow here at AEI. My colleague Joe Antos and I are very pleased to host a distinguished group of speakers today on the topic of positive disruption in healthcare, what will it take? I will e introduce each of them in just a few moments, and they'll each take a turn up here at the podium uh, making some remarks. Our purpose is to explore the ability of the private sector to transform the health sector for the better. Uh, there's certainly plenty of room for improvement. While medical care in the U.S. is often excellent and world-class, it is all too often wasteful and of low quality. Credible estimates put the amount of waste at about one-third of all spending. Medical errors and mistakes are rampant, as has been documented in numerous studies, and fraud is prevalent. From a consumer's perspective, and this is a main focus of our discussion this morning, the system is essentially maddening. Insurance is opaque and so complex that very few people really understand what gets covered and what doesn't. There's no price transparency for services and very few people can make sense of their bills. The paperwork is endless and redundant and seems designed really to legitimize the massive administrative bureaucracy that has been built up around the system and drives up costs for everyone. Most patients like their doctors but the system's fragmentation and lack of coordination is often harmful to their care. Too many patients get duplicative tests and the wrong diagnoses because of poor communication among providers. The dominant system of fee-for-service care encourages too many procedures that are unnecessary and not enough low-cost interventions that actually could keep people healthy. And the system is notoriously difficult to change in large part because the regulatory structure protects incumbents and makes it difficult for new entrants to get traction. The information technology revolution has transformed American industry after industry, and not just in America, but globally, but not really the health sector, which operates largely as it did oh, two and three decades ago. It remains common even after billions of dollars in investments in information technology in a host of platforms for patients to have no idea and no accessible record of exactly what services they receive from their providers. Most patients have no way of double checking key information such as immunization records. They have to ask their physicians for paper copies of critical medical information. The lack of price transparency leads to waste. Neither those providing the services nor those consuming them have a firm grasp of the prices they are actually paying for the services they receive. Consumers regularly overpay for their care because they have no easy way of knowing that they could get something less expensive from an alternative source. In short, despite all the good that is done for many patients, the health system, such as it is, because it really isn't a system, is suffering and has been for many decades from a basic level of dysfunction. And anyone who's a student of it and has observed it and worked in it comes to that conclusion pretty quickly. It underperforms on all, easy, all reasonable expectations for a system that is so important to the well-being of the country. And it, you know, the bottom line is it produces far too little of value for what is spent on it. So it needs to do much better. The basic question has always been how. The government is trying to help with an agenda that is focused on producing higher value care mainly through changes in payment incentives for providers. Some of these changes have real potential, but the jury remains out on whether the overall effort will bear some real fruit. But what about the private sector? In other sectors of our economy, entrepreneurs look at waste and inefficiency and see a major opportunity. Uh, they see the possibility of moving into a market, doing it better, delivering better value, and they know if they do so, they will attract consumers and become uh, profitable as a result. That's exactly what is needed in, in healthcare if we can get it. With the right incentives, 
Can entrepreneurs with good ideas also heal the health system on their own and without the need for further change in public policy? That's one of the main questions I think we want to try to explore. And we need to do so with our eyes wide open. One can go back in time to the 1980s and 1990s, and there were conferences not so different from the one we are holding today. And at those conferences, there was a great deal of optimism that managed care or consumer-driven health plans or some other version of more or less the same themes uh, was on the cusp of really bringing about a revolution in American health care. And of course, nothing really has happened yet to transform the basic dynamics of a dominant fee-for-service insurance system paid for through third-party insurance where the consumers are very uninvolved, the providers have great power, and uh, the system remains uh, inefficient. That was the case in the 80s and 90s, and it's I'm sad to say basically still true today, despite some signs of progress. So we need to be properly wary of just how hard this task is. Still, there are many promising things happening, and we want to explore what are the possibilities and obstacles with some of the people who are testing new ways of providing coverage and care to patients. Each of our speakers is involved in the private sector in some different ways to bring about va better value to patients. We are grateful to them for their willingness to come and share what they are seeing on the front lines, so to speak, of the private sector efforts to del deliver better value to patients. Let me now introduce each of them briefly. After, each, after, after our doing so, each of them will come up to the podium and share their individual experiences. After we've had a chance to hear from all of them, my colleague Joe Antos will help moderate a continued discussion amongst them and will conclude the day or the morning with uh, some time for audience questions. So uh, let's get started. Let me talk uh, a little bit about each of them and then we'll have the, the first speaker come up. Our first speaker is uh, Mario Schlosser, who is the CEO and co-founder of Oscar Health, a health insurance startup that uses technology, design, and data to help humanize and simplify healthcare. Previously, he co-founded the largest social gaming company in Latin America, where he led the company's analytics and game design practices. He uh, has great experience in a number of different venues. He holds a degree in computer science with highest distinction from the University of Hanover in Germany and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Our second speaker is Hill Ferguson, who is the CEO of Doctor on Demand. He has nearly two decades of experience in mobile technology. Uh, Mr. Hill led companies of, at all stages of growth from being a founder to being the senior executive at PayPal. Before joining Doctor on Demand, Mr. Ferguson helped transform PayPal into a more customer-focused technology company, leading the global mobile team and eventually serving as the company's chief product officer. He's got a a lot of experience in the tech world in a number of different venues. He holds a BA and an MBA from Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Clint Flanagan is a board-certified family medicine practitioner, has over 14 years of experience as an emergency room physician, and, certify, and, and maintains certificate, certificates in advanced cardiac and advanced trauma life support. He graduated from the University of Nebraska Medical Center and then completed his residency at St. Mary's Family Medicine Program in Grand Junction, Colorado. He is the uh, founding, founding member and is currently serving as the steering committee to the Direct Primary Care Coalition in Washington and is a leading advocate for direct primary care across the board. Uh, he is uh, here representing his company, which is Nextera Primary Care. Hassan Azar serves as the Senior Vice President of Total Rewards at U.S. Foods. He is responsible for the strategic direction and management of U.S. Foods Employee Compensation and Benefit Programs, an Employee Service Center, Human Resources Information Systems, Executive Compensation and Stock Programs. He has long experience in the employee benefit uh, realm, uh, managing that portfolio for a number of different companies over the years. Uh, he has been a director of the National Business Group on Health since June 2017, he has an MBA, a Master's in Health Services Administration, and a BA from the University of Michigan. He also has a law degree from the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. Finally, our last speaker will be Bob Kocher. He's a partner at Venrock Investments. 
He serves on the board of Devoted Health, Verta Health, Alidaid, Lyra Health, and Premier Blue Cross. Uh, he's a physician, um, and he's an adjunct professor at Stanford University's School of Medicine and senior fellow and advisory board member at the University of Southern California's Center for Health Policy and Economics. I've gotten to know Bob. Uh, we served together on an advisory board together, and he's uh, terrific uh, knowledge from his time at working in the Obama administration on health policy. Uh, so he has both uh, direct governmental experience and now for many years a direct experience as an observer and an investor in various initiatives in the private sector. So with that, let's turn it over to Mario and get the conversation started. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Okay, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Jim, and uh, to the AEI. Uh, I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Oscar Insurance. Um, about six years ago, we started the company. And uh, at the time, I had a computer science background. I was going through pregnancy with um, our first kids, my wife and I. And just all this complexity and the costliness of healthcare really hit us in what otherwise should be a positive experience, delivering a baby. Uh, and I really thought that the insurance company in particular was fairly useless in helping me navigate the complexities of the healthcare system. Even though it sits at an interesting point in the system, it should see all the data running through the system, it should have its hand on the dollars flowing throughout the system and the incentives in it, uh, and yet, it really didn't seem very consumer-oriented. And so we thought if we can start an insurance company that primarily really becomes an entry point to the healthcare system for our members, um, we could have a fairly good leverage on the system overall. And I brought a few, um, here we go, brought a few slides to explain that a little bit. The font's a little off, please excuse that. Um, so at a high level, what we thought we have to become really is a direct-to-consumer health insurer where members who join us um, from the very beginning want, want our help in navigating healthcare. That's, we gotta earn that trust, of course, but uh, that's the basic premise. We have a lot more, if you will, influence um, over whether you have a good experience in navigating healthcare if you sort of like come to us with any issues you might have um, in the system. And we thought for that, for that we need to be a full stack company. Um, again, my background's computer science. I thought about this originally as, you know, you build a software project, uh, you get a bunch of APIs, some cloud vendors, you put them together, you've got a good product. That's not the way healthcare really works. Um, there isn't um, much in the way of good functioning technology pipes between various vendors and, and various actors in the system. And I'll talk a bit about the value of healthcare information and how the existing players don't seem to really value it that much uh, a little bit later on. So full stack means we build everything in house from claims to underwriting, to even some of the um, care delivery services as well. And what that should get us is higher engagements, members actually coming to us when they have issues, um, and enabling that through better technology uh, to then become the entry points to higher value health healthcare at a high level. Uh, it seems to be working quite well. We're at 250,000 members now. It's about 1.2 billion in um, revenues in 2018. Uh, open enrollment is opening again for next year, so we'll hopefully grow quite a bit there again. Uh, we generally focus on the uh, individual markets, um, aka Obamacare markets, uh, and then also the small employer markets. Um, and we're going to go into the Medicare Advantage markets in 2020. Those markets share one characteristics, uh, characteristicum, which is that they are the closest to being individualized. Individuals have more choice in the kind of plans they want to buy, the benefits they want to buy, and the networks they want to buy into. And we feel that's very important, and I'll talk a bit about why that's the case. Um, you know, we, I actually very much believe in the fact that uh, there ought to be a consumer-driven market um, in healthcare. And I do think that as the insurance company, we have a very good position to kind of make that happen or enable that. I think that right now, we've got the worst of both worlds in the healthcare system in the U.S. We've got sort of like a thing that is a sort of a free market. Everybody can put, you know, a shingle on their door and call themselves an emergency room in certain states. Um, and get the reimbursement for that. Uh, but we don't really have any of the market forces that force, let's say, cost and quality into line. Neither the transparency nor the, tr the ability to choose on the part of the members um, and issues like that. And I, I brought a few data points that we see internally that I think highlight this. And they're discussion starters. I don't have the perfect system in my mind that we should design, but they are starters for the discussion we're going to have here later on. I want to remind you, first of all, that uh, as the first point here, healthcare pricing is insane. Uh, and this is a good example for that. Um, this shows what happens when members who have an abdominal pain episodes, okay, we take all of our claims and drugs, whatever, we bundle them into episodes of care from beginning of an episode to the end of an episode, when you're healthy, again, if you will, if you will. and we subselect those who 
um, are experienced by members who otherwise are healthy. Again, we get internal classifications that help us figure this out. And you see here what happens when a member with an abdominal pain episode goes to a primary care physician versus goes to an emergency room. Uh, and obviously, uh, what you see here is that you know, the reimbursement rates are way higher in emergency rooms. Um, and the probability of getting something like a CAT scan also is way higher. There's no PCP in any one of the abdominal pain episodes we've had that has sort of like thought, I gotta get you a CAT scan. Um, but there are about 40% of that time that happens when you go to the ER as a health member with abdominal pain, you get a CAT scan, basically, at a very high reimbursement rate here. And so right there, that is not something members typically will know, um, necessarily. That's, I think, becoming a more of a talking point. Um, but that can still happen to you very, very easily. Do you think you're covered and you suddenly get a big bill, uh, particularly if you have a deductible in the plan as well? And that is the case because there aren't really any market forces on cost and on quality, in my view. And again, this is an, a picture from inside of Oscar. So this is, a, this is our New York um, physician network. And this is actually all the primary care physicians, um, including OBGYNs and, and pediatricians as well. Uh, what we rank them here is based on um, kind of on the X here, doctors with uh, better cost outcomes to the left, so more efficiency and lower cost, obviously. Doctors with worth, worse cost outcomes to the right. And this is, again, on an all-episode basis. So anything that this physician would recommend you do within an episode of care, including referrals to the hospital, referrals to the ER, potentially, and things like that. You can see there's a fairly wide spectrum. It really goes, um, you can sort of like, uh, if you go all the way to the left there and compare this all the way to the right, there's a factor of three or four in the cost a physician will drive in terms of everything that will happen all in. On the other axis here, and so each doctor is a physician, by the way, on the other axis here is um, uh, one version of outcomes. You know, we can quibble about a definition of clinical outcomes or outcomes generally. Uh, this is one we picked in this case, which is just do they make people happy, these doctors? Um, and we get that by asking them about a couple of questions about the care that they receive that isn't highly correlated with clinical outcomes, frankly, but the picture looks similar when you run versions of clinical outcomes as well. And, and what you see basically is that there's no correlation between those two things. And that's, again, a fairly well-established fact um, in healthcare. It's just interesting for us to reproduce this on a physician-by-physician -physician basis. What we can then do as a result is we can say, okay, let's go to these doctors in the top left there and put them into a kind of like more integrated partner program. We call this the provider partner program or the top doctor program. We put them in our mobile app and our websites and among our concierge teams, that's our customer service team, um, at a high level of ranking, uh, we, get, we try to connect to their electronic medical record systems so we can schedule directly into their practice management systems. Uh, and um, a doctor that's in those blue dots here will generally go and see about four or five X the Oscar patients um, than a doctor who's not on the top doctor program. So we can kind of like route some of the, steer some of that care. For first time physician visits of all Oscar members, uh, about 40% of those we can kind of show when we get the claim were found, or those members found the doctor through one of the Oscar tools, whether it's the app, the websites, or talking to our concierge teams. And so we can, again, kind of keep that in the family and make sure you go to the right doctor there. Uh, so that's, why is there no market force on this? Um, in my view, it has a lot to do with the fact that um, most of the players in the healthcare system have had an incentive for the past couple of decades to build broad networks. Uh, where every hospital and every physician basically has to be in. If you're an employer in New York City, you've got 10,000 employees, you know, uh, there will be, uh, every doctor in the city will be seen by one of your employees. It's hard to then go in and say, all of you 10,000 people now only get access to half of the doctors in the city, even though that half could very well be in that top left quadrant there, and you don't need the other half. Uh, and so that's a difficult thing to build, again, if you sort of like pool um, too many members from a decision-making point of view, and I think one version of the healthcare system in the future would have to be to give uh, in individuals more choice as to what kind of networks they want to buy, what kind of all-in healthcare experience they want to really buy and pay for. So, uh, and I talked about, actually talked about this a little bit here. This just tracks over time now. Um, what is the consequence of the fact that we are able to take 40% of members who are looking for a physician and recommending that right physician to them, uh, you see that both the average cost driven by the doctors that members end up picking goes down by about 11% vis-a-vis -vis the average our network, and the average happiness of the member experience score goes up. So you, it's a weird industry if you can get both lower cost and better outcomes at the same time. Again, shows the absence of market forces in the system. Uh, a word of caution, I think, as well, is that I do think that the existing tools that we have at our disposal right now are a little too blunt. Um, in the past 10 years alone, I think about 51% of American 
uh, workers who get employer coverage even have seen the deductibles go from you know, close to zero to now over a thousand bucks. Um, over 50% of, of people in the US insured have deductibles over a thousand dollars. And that is to some degree a good idea. To some degree it limits or it sort of like morphs utilization in not always useful ways. Um, this is now again a slice of our membership base and the utilization 2017, 2018. We're looking here at 40 to 50 year old members who are categorized by us as healthy, meaning we haven't seen any lab tests or any kind of self-reported data or any drugs that indicate that they have a chronic condition or anything like that. And they have a so-called risk score between 0.2 and 0.4. And that's a government definition for how sick members are, how many chronic conditions they have and things like that. So they are relatively healthy members. Um, you see two different utilization factors here. Uh, one is in the blue bar here, um, for members with low deductibles on the left and members with high deductibles on the right, how much telemedicine they're using on a PM, PM basis, PM, PM is per member per month. Per month. Uh, you know, ignore the y-axis there, just kind of compare roughly the, the, the height of these blue bars there. What you can see there is that if you have a low deductible or no deductible, you're in that left part of the chart there, you know, you have, don't have that much um, uh, sort of encouragement to use telemedicine, perhaps, even though it is a convenient way to kind of solve many of your issues. You may be more tempted to simply go to an urgent care clinic right away or in the ER around the corner. You may have a low copay there and just walk in there and get your care there. Uh, if your deductible goes up and you will face more out-of-pocket costs as results, you will start looking for lower-cost venues of care. And by the way, you'll also start liking it, you know, telemedicine. Well, here, I'm sure next, with the next speaker as well, is obviously a fantastic solution for many, many issues in the healthcare system. So that's, a, I think, a good thing overall, that people are actively seeking out, if the incentives change, different venues of care. The gray bar, though, I think shows the flip side of that. Um, that is any kind of minor surgery. And for all these members who are pretty comparable, but picked two different kind of types of plans with deductibles, that also moves the utilization around on minor surgery. And so there is at least some indication there that perhaps some members um, sort of like hold off from having minor surgeries that they maybe should be having. Um, that's uh, be just because they now fear the cost impact from being under deductible. Uh, and again, that to me means that we have to think harder, I think, about sort of like the blunt tool of deductibles and see what kind of pre-deductible benefits can we load into plans. Um, should they be sort of like, you know, uh, until $1,000 you covered, above that you, you then pay out of pockets and then you cover it again or something like that. Those are all things we are thinking about experimenting with, um, but that run at times into regulatory issues. Um, so we don't have, you know, complete control over plan designs. Um, again, I think that's generally a reasonable thing. We don't want everybody to run all over across, across the spectrum of plan design possibilities, um, but some more freedom is needed. And final points, um, I think this is a very subtle thing, but um, I, came, I sort of like thought about this the other day, um, and uh, it, 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 it um, uh, reflects on a notion that I think is happening in the markets right now. The healthcare markets don't really seem to value uh, the value of information. Uh, on the left side there, you see the average market order execution speed in seconds of the New York Stock Exchange. So if you go 10 years back or 15 years back or so, you know, it took like 20, 30 seconds or so to execute an order. And that then came down um, over the next 15 years. And then around 2008, 2009, you start seeing the advent of high frequency trading. And since then, it's come down even more. Um, and sort of what happens there is, is on the one hand, of course, exchanges and market players are competing to get you the quickest execution speeds. You know, that's like a nice thing to execute your order 10 seconds earlier or whatever else. But the even more important thing that's happening there is that the market players who drive that change have realized that there's value to the information you get by being first, by seeing what's happening in the markets. So they want to get the information earlier, and therefore they build the systems and put the incentives in to get the information earlier. You're paying for a market execution flow and things like that. And so on the right side is um, uh, the average um, uh, time that it takes insurance companies to pay claims between the time when they get the claim when they pay it. So it's still about 14 days or so. And from all I can tell, it hasn't changed very much in the past couple of years. This is only the last 18 months here, yeah, but still, it's about that, 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 that level. Um, and in the, the gray bar, is, uh, the gray chart is us. We've been building a bunch of internal software that really enables us to pay claims more quickly. And the biggest motivation for that, on the one hand, of course, is that we want to make the hospitals happier we work with and the physicians happier we work with by paying faster. But on the other hand, we want to get this information faster. We want to see the claims more early on because um, that gives us a better idea of who is 
getting sick, who's in the process of going into potentially a chronic disease, um, and where do we have to engage earlier on? Again, the signals we get from telemedicine are a fantastic example for that. Um, we flag in telemedicine phone calls if uh, somebody's at risk of going to the ER urgent care and follow up with the nurse giving you a phone call after such a telemedicine interaction because we then think we can kind of move some of that care around. And again, the fact that um, in finance where play market players have realized the value of information, these execution periods come down, but in healthcare it really hasn't to me, means, again, that most players in the healthcare system don't have financial incentive to value more clinical information to be considered more quickly between each other, to be able to react to it and to be able to do something with it. And it again goes back to the fact that the existing system we have isn't particularly competitive um, from a cost and quality perspective. There isn't enough um, uh, sort of like forces, um, competitive forces on the supply chain in particular because individuals can't really put that, exert that pressure on the supply chain. I can't quit my insurance company often if I'm in employer coverage. I can't um, you know, even oftentimes quit my hospital if they've sort of like hold my records captive. Um, I, I can't quit my, I don't know, PBM, for example, um, the ones that negotiate my drug prices. And as a result, uh, that competitive pressure really is lacking, and I think we've got to get more of that into the system. And so I do finally think that uh, uh, you know, this is another chart here. What, what happens when, um, when uh, final, so in the seven days leading up to an ER visit, uh, we at Oscar see that about 80% um, of members have some interaction with us, so it shows you the value of information. I'm running out of time, so I won't go too deep into that. So uh, final point is that um, I do think we have uh, been chipping away at this at a good clip over the past couple of years at Oscar now. Uh, you should sign up as well if you want to. We're open room is just launching again now. Um, <laughs> The importance is, I do think, that uh, uh, one way I think about the system is um, if, we would allow, if we were able to allow employers to take the pre-tax dollars that they give to their employees and give the employees more choice in what they want to buy, that could unleash a whole bunch of interesting innovation across the system. And I'm looking forward to the discussion coming out of this. Thank you. Feel a little bit like Luke Skywalker here in uh, Star Wars 3, getting into the podium. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jim and the AEI, for inviting me here to speak, um, and welcome all of you here. I'm looking forward to giving you just a brief introduction to Doctor on Demand. If I can pull up my slides here. Here we go. So how many of you remember this item? Too long ago, right? Uh, until recently, this was the best product the financial services industry could serve up to consumers for sending money to anyone. Um, we all know how this change happened. They were forced by innovation in the market. A small company 15 years ago called PayPal came out with a better way to transfer money digitally to anyone anywhere in the world. More recently, innovative companies have come into industries like hospitality and offer consumers better choices and better ways to spend their time and money when they travel. One of the examples that I love is more in the transportation industry. Um, companies like ride-tailing services like um, Uber and Lyft have come and taken this idea of a very scarce resource, right? a personal driver, a chauffeur that was once relegated only to the rich and fancy in the world and made it available to anyone. Healthcare is really no different. I mean, you can look at these other industries and say, yeah, but healthcare is different. Well, these are regulated industries, uh, entrenched incumbents, um, lots of laws to protect and, uh, and keep people in power. We're all familiar with this scene today, the waiting room filled with sick people and many germs. Um, companies like Doctor on Demand are coming in and trying to lead with a consumer-driven mindset to make this experience delightful. And I believe that a doctor visit should be delightful, and it can be delightful. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit about why we think this is an important problem to solve. You all recognize this as the triple aim in health care. Until recently, you could have two, but not three. Now with technology, we can have all three together, and we don't have to trade anything off. It's important because it comes at a time when we're at a record level of shortages for physicians. Um, we estimate that in... 20, 10, 20 years, there could be a shortage of up to 100,000 physicians in the U.S. Right now, anywhere from 20 to 30,000, depending on, on how you count it. That's a massive problem, and it's just getting worse. You see that show up 
in a few things. The first is the average time to see a primary care physician in this country is 18 days. The cost at around $150. Banker's hours, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Uh, it's no surprise that only 30% of Americans who are adults have a primary care physician. Why do you need one? A more recent study came out last week from the Kaiser Foundation that found that half of all millennials don't have a primary care doctor. So the trend is definitely you know, moving away from this model. And what we do is we come in and we try to solve this on all dimensions. So we take an 18-day wait time and reduce it to four minutes. We make our service open to all, with or without a primary care physician relationship, with or without insurance, um, reducing the cost to $50, and then making it open all night, 24-7, 365, Christmas Day, weekends, holidays, whenever. You can see a doctor in four minutes on our service. If you haven't used it before, it's quite simple. You can download our app, go to our website. Um, you can go through and look at any one of our doctors, look at their background. We're a national employed practice of providers, primary care, and mental health professionals. Um, most customers seek to do an on-demand visit, and they'll wait a few minutes. Sometimes you'll go in and you'll want to schedule an appointment with a provider that you like. Maybe you want to see a female doctor, maybe you want to see a psychiatrist. We'll take information on your medical history, your allergies, uh, run a real-time eligibility check on your insurance coverage, offer you a price for a copay that is the final price. It's not just an estimate that you get a bill in the mail in later. Um, and you go straight into having your virtual doctor consultation. Our doctors have, on average, 15 years clinical experience. They're all board certified. As I mentioned, they're primarily primary care doctors, but we also employ physicians, I mean, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists uh, for our mental health practice. More recently, in the last few years, we've been um, getting a lot of traction in the enterprise, which is to say we've been selling into large self-insured employers and health plans who now offer Doctor On Demand as a covered benefit to about 31 million Americans. This has driven a lot of growth in our business. Um, we have always had a very strong attention to quality. And so there have been previous studies that have come out on telemedicine saying, oh, the quality is not as good. Doctors overprescribe. Um, it's additive to the cost of care. Last year, we got results from a national health plan who had been monitoring our service and did a study two years running, looked at data from patients that, cases that we treated and compared it to cases that were treated in office in their physician network. And what they found was quite surprising to them, less so to us. They found that our practice prescribes antibiotics at two percentage points lower than their in-office network. Um, and probably the most important thing they found was that the 14-day readmission rate which measures the rate at which people go back into the healthcare system after having seen a doctor, was on par with their in-office uh, physician network. Of course, we all knew the cost would be lower. The blended cost average of about $250 per incident, that's a um, weighted across emergency room, urgent care, and in-office visit, compared to $49 for our service. So delivering on the same levels of quality uh, but a fraction of the cost is the opportunity that we have with telemedicine, specifically the way that we're practicing it. Just quickly, we're a five-year-old company. Uh, we launched in 2014 with a uh, cash pay service for urgent care, um, then pushing into the enterprise, making our service compatible with health insurance plans as well as self-insured employers, uh, doing things like HL7 integrations, real-time eligibility checks, uh, a couple of years ago, we opened our mental health practice. We think this is a really important part of the opportunity in front of us to integrate both care for the mind and the body in one record in the cloud, enabling our physicians to share information and treat comorbidities uh, more quickly and at a lower cost. It's a very strong differentiator. Last year, we spent most of our time and energy laying the foundation to, um, to, to treat chronically ill patients. Um, we now allow um, our, all of our doctors to order lab tests so we can treat both the uh, acute conditions as well as the chronics. Uh, and this year, we've been growing really, really quickly. We surpassed a million video visits in the first half of this year in just under four and a half years of being live. And uh, look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Clint Flanagan. Uh, I've been a family medicine physician and emergency medicine physician uh, for over 15 years now in the Colorado area. 
Uh, thanks to Jim uh, and AEI for this opportunity, and thanks to the Direct Primary Care Coalition uh, for the opportunity as well. So a um, little bit about our story, I guess, on the Uber theme, uh, as well as Airbnb. We're kind of not like Netflix for primary care. So patients pay a fixed monthly fee and or their employer, and we take care of them. 24-7, uh, 365, in-office visits, face-to-face -face visits, uh, virtual visits. And that model is called direct primary care. So maybe just to show of hands, how many in the crowd have heard of direct primary care before I just said it? That is awesome. Uh, years ago, it was zero. Uh, so we started down this pathway in Colorado uh, as a family medicine doctor and also as an ER doctor. Um, Many years ago, uh, you know, the, the differences between those two models of healthcare are, are black and white. In family medicine, we want relationships. We want time with our patients. We want to be able to build trust. Uh, we want to take care of patients for years. In ER, uh, patients should not be our friends, right? We shouldn't be seeing you again and again. Uh, and if we are, that's a big problem. Uh, as you see us as an ER doc, we're really expensive. As a family medicine doc, we can be very, 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 very affordable. And your family medicine physician, your primary care doctor, primary care provider, internist, a pediatrician, et cetera, can take care of most things for patients. 80 to 90% of healthcare needs can be taken care of by your primary care physician. Now, how many of you in the room have a primary care physician? Excellent. How many of you can text that doctor, can, in, can get in today for a same-day appointment for an urgent issue, uh, and how many can email your doctor and have uh, a, a good response same day? A couple that probably have direct primary care doctors. I know one of them that raised their hand has a direct primary care doctor, right? Uh, so we're paying all this money, right? Yet we don't have the Airbnb, we don't have the Netflix, we don't have the Uber capabilities in healthcare to see our primary care physician. That's a catastrophe. For the amount of money we're paying, which is, I think, close to maybe $4 trillion, we should have that, right? We should have that level of service. The challenge, or one of the many challenges, is the model that's been set up is this insurance card model. So we carry around an insurance card, hoping that that's going to get us entry into the gym. And the problem is it can get you entry, but as Hill pointed out, that entry may take 30 days to get in to see your primary care doctor. So what do you do? You go to an urgent care or you go to an emergency room. Uh, we shouldn't have urgent cares in this country. The reason we have urgent cares is because it's hard to get in to see your primary care doctor. We definitely should have emergency rooms, but the emergency room should be for an emergency. The challenge is when a person comes into the ER and sees me for an earache, it's going to cost $1,000 or something the like. Versus when you see your direct primary care doctor, that cost could be zero uh, uh, for that transaction. Which, what has happened over time is patients uh, have to use this card to get in to see their primary care provider, that insurance card. And that'd be kind of the equivalent of you taking your auto insurance card and filling your car up with gas, or taking your auto insurance card and washing your car, or rotating your tires, or doing maintenance and prevention on your car. Insurance is not made for that. Insurance is made for when the house burns down. Insurance is made for when your car gets totaled. Insurance is made for when you need a stent in your heart or when you need a total knee. Using insurance to pay for low-cost primary care doesn't make a lot of sense. And in that model of primary care in this country, patients are unfortunately kind of seen as transactions. Because every time your primary care doctor, your pediatrician, family medicine doctor sees the patient, they bill for that, right? And as they bill for that, uh, they've realized that in order to, to bring revenue into the door, I need to see more patients. So most family medicine doctors, primary care physicians can see 25 to 35 patients per day. The average visit time is about 7 to 10 minutes. It's one thing if you're diagnosing strep, but what if you're dealing with depression? What if you're dealing with hypothyroidism and diabetes and obesity and alcoholism all in one visit? That's not a five-minute visit, right? So we realized that uh, the existing model, which they didn't tell us in med school and they didn't tell us in residency, Right? We studied for many, many years <laughs> and came out and were like, it took me all of about, unfortunately, um, five years after residency to figure out that, that this business model is really, really, really challenging for primary care. So we said, why don't we just do this? Let's go to our patients, let's go to employers, and let's take care of them. Provide primary care and urgent care services and do so in a way where 
uh, we're not going to use the insurance card for that. We're going to ask our patients or ask the employer to pay us directly. Uh, so we started down that pathway, and at the time, we didn't know what direct primary care was. We just called it monthly membership medicine. And then we found a few others in the country that were calling themselves direct primary care, like Dr. Garrison Bliss out in Seattle. And along that pathway, you know, we kind of banded together, and one vehicle for that was the Direct Primary Care Coalition that, you know, we started exchanging ideas of what we were each doing in our own zip codes. In our mission, very early on at Next Era Healthcare, uh, and again, it's the Next Era, that was my wife that um, we can thank for that, because uh, we weren't happy with the existing era, so we needed something different. Initially, we thought revolutionary healthcare, but um, there were some details, and I'll tell you about that later. So we ended up with Next Era Healthcare. So uh, we started down that pathway, and we very much had a focus and a mission at Next Era Healthcare to help our patients get to optimal health. Help our patients get to optimal health, and we wanted to make sure they had a meaningful experience. So we didn't want to be just sick care doctors. That's a lot of what our health care system is these days, right? It's if you get sick, you go in. How many of you are excited to go to the doctor? Right? How many are looking forward to that when you wake up? So we wanted a bit of a paradigm shift there where a big part of our focus is what can we do to get you healthier? What can we do to be proactive? What can we do to be preventative? What can we do to actually make it be a meaningful experience? And what can we do... Uh, on that front in an affordable way. So our average per member per month that our members pay us for their gym membership or for their Netflix is around $60 to $70 per member per month. Uh, per a recent article in SHRM, which is an HR magazine, an employer is paying around $15,000 a year per employee for coverage, right? So for a small percentage of that amount, you can actually have your primary care doctor that primary care doctor can be essentially on speed dial with really cool HIPAA secure apps that we use, uh, and you not, now start to have a relationship. Most Americans don't have that right now, and we realized that about in 2009. And we said, hey, we need to have something that, A, allows for primary care physicians to maintain their practice and continue to own it. In our opinion, and maybe my opinion particularly, there's hardly anything better in small business in America. And what I saw at the time was a lot of private primary care practices closing or selling out to large systems because they couldn't afford to keep the doors open and pay their nurses and buy electronic medical records and do all these things that the models at that time said that we should be doing. So owning my own private primary care practice, I said we just need to have a different business model that can help support that. Uh, Hill brought up the triple aim which we completely agree with. How can we take care of people, do it in a more comfortable manner, uh, and, and move that ball forward, right? We like to call it a quadruple aim, and in fact, there's even now a quintuple aim. So the quadruple aim is how can we do all of what Hill mentioned in that slide put out by the Institute uh, IHI, Institute of Health, I think, is where that comes from. How can we do all that but also have a model that doctors want to work in, right? Let's not forget that. Because we've been designing a lot over the years with a lot of acronyms, and in the end, doctors don't want to work in these things, and they get burned out, right? And if they're burned out and they're not liking it, they're not going to be the doctor that they could be, right? So the direct primary care movement was created by physicians for patients, first and foremost. So we can have that trust and relationship, but it was also created by us because we saw problems. We had hoped that the Affordable Care Act would create some solutions, uh, and I think there were some solutions that were created by that. But what also happened is you saw these premiums just continuing to go up, right? Which kind of indirectly said, maybe I should only use my insurance for what it should be used for. Cancer, heart attacks, strokes. But gosh, I can't use that insurance for my primary care doc because my insurance only gives me one preventative visit a year. And then I'm out of pocket for visits thereafter. I'm out of pocket until I meet my $5,000 or $10,000 deductible. So indirectly... The ACA kind of helped us in the direct primary care movement, and it got people to really be ad advocates of how they're spending their dollar. It got employers to really th thinking about that, and if anything is moving the dial, it's employers in this country that are moving the dial on innovation in healthcare. So our target, as I mentioned earlier, was our patients, families, and employer groups. So we started with around two or three clinics in the Boulder, Colorado, Longmont area, and we have moved now to, we have around 40, uh, a little over 40 clinics across the country. About 90 to 92% or so of our membership is employers. So we take care of employers, electricians, plumbers. We take care of carpet layers. 
Uh, we take care of uh, really cool craft beer companies. We take care of municipalities, school districts, uh, satellite companies, rocket scientists, you know, the list goes on. And, and the way that that works essentially is the employer pays the monthly fee. They pay the Netflix membership for the employee and or in some cases the family. So they're paying that and that's their care, right? And they have coverage. Most Nextera patients have coverage. They have either a high deductible HSA type plan and or they have a um, PPO type plan. So again, most of them have coverage, but we want people to start thinking about that coverage like fire insurance for your home. You know, you don't walk into Lowe's or Home Depot with your insurance card buying paint, right? You don't even hopefully ever have to use your fire insurance. Uh, however, you do want to take care of your house, just as you should want to take care of yourself. And we see our uh, mission, as I mentioned, to say, hey, we want to really be that partner for you. We want to help you navigate because it is a very dysfunctional, crazy, expensive ecosystem that we have in healthcare. So we want to help our patients navigate. We can, how do we do that? We don't do that by just having one visit a year. In the direct primary care movement, typically patients are having four, five, six, seven times more visits per year than they are in the primary care setting. That's uh, the traditional fee-for-service insurance setting. So our patients are visiting us more. They're starting to get trust back in their doctor. Uh, and that trust and relationship happens. The next thing you know, what do, we, we, what do we see? We start to see improvements in obesity. We see improvements in diabetes. We see improvements in cholesterol. We, they start to get their depression treated. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We start to see uh, with employer groups decreased ER visits by 40 to 50 percent. 40 to 50 percent, and that's replicated not only uh, with a school district we take care of, but also with a satellite company that we take care of. Uh, we see uh, we make impacts on absenteeism, presenteeism, hiring, retention. So employer groups like us for that. We do on-site clinics for some of our larger employers, and HR teams walk their new hires by the on-site clinic. And HR has told us, hey, uh, this is one of the best benefits that we like to pitch to on incoming employees, that they can come out of their cubicle, over to see the doctor for their depression, for their diabetes, for their obesity, and go right back into their cubicle. Uh, it, it creates efficiencies that are much, much different than what we have in the existing system. The existing system in the Denver area is it takes 26 to 30 days to get in to see a primary care doctor. He's going to see you for maybe 5 to 10 minutes. And then, uh, you know, you're likely going to get a bill for that, especially if you have a high deductible, unless it was a preventative checkup. So, um, as you, there will be all kinds of solutions. Uh, and, and my gosh, we need innovation and solutions. Because what's happening right now is bankrupting, uh, especially middle class America, right? So we need some innovation, we need some solutions, uh, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. Uh, it's making an impact in our patients' lives, it's making an impact for employers and our communities, uh, and it's also making a tremendous impact for physicians. So you now have doctors that, rather than retiring because they're kind of fed up with the existing insurance model, they're staying on and working another five or ten years. You have residents coming out of residency doing direct primary care. Uh, so that, uh, th this solution that, that uh, again, we had no clue what direct primary care was. We just knew we had to do something different. That was back in about 2009. Fast forward to 2018, it's working. Uh, and the cool thing is uh, patients like it, doctors like it, employers like it. And I appreciate the opportunity and happy to talk more as uh, we move forward. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here representing the purchasers and the employers uh, of the country. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about innovation and how we view innovation as helping the American business, especially innovation in healthcare delivery. Uh, for background, uh, again, Hassan Azar is my name. I, I work at U.S. Foods. We're a large U.S. Uh, food distributor. We have about 25,000 employees spread across the United States. And like every other employer uh, in this country, regardless of the size, it's essential for us to have um, healthy employees actually help us deliver on our strategy. So one of my goals at U.S. Foods is to ensure that all of our employees have access to effective tools to help them manage their health and to help their families. Um, 
Every day our employees are interacting with the healthcare system and more and more are choosing to use an innovative service that we actually made available to them. So for example, some of our employees today will probably use a connected device to share their blood glucose levels with the diabetes coach. Some will talk to a health advocate to receive guidance about their care plan. And some will call our second opinion vendor to actually make sense of a recent diagnosis. And some of our employees are gonna perform physical therapy in their own home tonight using a connected device um, and talking to a remote therapist. So a few years ago, none of these types of services were available or on my radar, but today they become part of our benefits ecosystem. And these programs are highly valued by our employees. Our employees appreciate the new model of care, the convenience, the personalized treatment, the guidance, and the experience. And employers are seeing rapid adoption of these new ways of delivering care programs, and we're anxious to see even more innovative and disruptive ways for us to share with our employees. So today I'm going to provide some examples of how our employees are experiencing the most recent innovations in healthcare and benefits delivery. And I'm going to wrap up with a wish list of some other forms of innovation and disruption that employers may find useful in the future. So to begin with, let me outline the goals that most employers have with their healthcare programs. As we've heard a few times today, it's commonly known as the triple aim. Over 10 years ago, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement developed this triple aim framework. And this has become the mantra for many employers as we develop our healthcare benefits programs. As you can see on the screen, its aspirations are clear to improve health, improve the healthcare experience, and manage costs. And they, were as important, they are as important today as they were 10 years ago. And these goals remain important partially because healthcare costs continue to rise. As the costs increase, Way, employers search for, new, search for and test new ways to manage their costs. And it's probable that healthcare costs will continue to rise for the foreseeable future. We're going to continue to seek for innovation to help. But American businesses can't do it alone, which is why we've always been partnering with a wide range of innovators, such as the ones you've heard today, to help us meet our goals. So employers have become actively involved in working with key stakeholders in the healthcare industry to address a variety of healthcare issues. We're working to influence the design and delivery of healthcare by piloting and encouraging new programs, tools, and partnerships, and that helps us meet the triple aim. And employers every day are considering new solutions to help them manage their healthcare programs. So for decades, business leaders have long embraced the solutions that help our employees become or stay healthy, manage their illness or chronic condition, and improve access to a healthcare system. Over the past few years, the pace of innovation um, helping, us, helping us manage our benefit plans has grown dramatically. So today, I'll point out just a few that are showing promising results. So I've bucketed these newer solutions for conversation, but many of the things I'm going to describe are actually belong, they actually belong in multiple categories. So starting with health delivery, we have looked at how our employees receive health care services. Today, we have access to new programs to ensure that our employees get the right care at the right time and place. And this includes such things as expert opinion services, also known as second opinion services, as I mentioned. And these are helping our patients, our, our employees understand their treatment options and make medical decisions. Our employees can actually call a vendor who'll get a nationally renowned expert to review their medical records and confirm or adjust a diagnosis or treatment. Telemedicine, as we heard from Hill about his company, Doctor on Demand, telemedicine has been incorporated into the strategies of companies of all sizes over the past few years and will continue to grow and be important. And we're helping our employees manage their health. So over the past few years, employers have been increasingly interested in arming our employees with support to help them achieve optimal health. We're doing this through such programs as disease management, by which we utilize a third party vendor who is not our health plan or the provider, to give guidance, decision support, and education for individuals who are living with a chronic disease. These services provide coaching, and provide coaching and needed direction using digital communications to engage our employees in the treatment of their own condition and their effective improving the health of their employees and their families. And at-home treatment. Services that be conducted outside of a medical, typical medical facility have been readily accepted by employers and employees over the past few years. Real-time monitoring of clinical data for a number of conditions is showing promise as patients are increase, 
increasingly willing to utilize these services. Our employees and their families are quickly adopting new types of, of um, remote and virtual services. We're seeing impressive adoptions of remote services in the fields of diabetes treatment, as I mentioned earlier, where an employee can work with a diabetes coach. Physical therapy, where an employee can perform uh, treatment at home at the convenience of their own setting and on their own time. Um, behavioral health, offered through an app or video. Cardiovascular health, through a connected blood pressure cuff. Maternity care, sleep management, and weight loss. We're even seeing employees re reversing the effects of diabetes through a home monitored nutritional program. And patient engagement. We're focused on ensuring that employees are informed and involved in their healthcare journey and that they receive guidance wherever, they, wherever and whenever they need it. We want to make sure that our employees get the help they need to manage their health. Healthcare is complicated and confusing. Patients are asked to make a lot of decisions and digest a lot of information. They need to know what to do, where to go, what questions to ask their providers, and what to expect next. And to better equip our employees, we've recently begun to offer high-touch advocacy programs. These advocacy programs are helping employees manage and navigate their care, and it helps employees understand their treatment options, navigate the healthcare system, and handle administrative issues that may arise, such as trying to understand a hospital bill. As one of my employees said, it's like the concierge in a hotel to help you figure out where to go, what to do, and I'll arrange everything for you, and it's really making a difference. So I'll turn to wellness briefly. So for, for many years, employers have been investing in wellness programs and bringing health promotion to the workplace. In the past couple of years, the wellness providers that the employers partner with have become more sophisticated and effective in how they engage individuals using mobile technology and personalized outreach. We're using social networks, gamification, apps, and mobile platforms to make an individual's wellness journey more engaging. And lastly, provider partnerships. Over the past few years, employers have seen an increasing number of opportunities to work <clears throat> with medical providers to meet the triple aim. Some employers are partnering with ACOs, dedicated clinics, and high-performing networks to shape the delivery of healthcare to their employees. And other companies, such as ours, are using centers of excellence approach with a bundled surgery payment to improve health outcomes while managing costs. We partnered with a vendor, again, who's not our health plan, who's created a network of high-quality surgeons and facilities across the country. Our employees who need certain types of surgeries can access this network um, of centers of excellence voluntarily and with an increased benefit level and another form of concierge treatment. And it's going to help the employee and their family through, through the surgery process. This gives a summary of just a few of the innovative things that employers are offering their employees. And as more employers embrace this first wave of recent innovation, we'll seek even more impactful changes that can disrupt only while allowing the triple aim to be met. So employers, employers have a continued interest in innovation and future disruption. The strategic goals of many employers remain focused on the three aims that the IHA outlined, and we will embrace disruption that helps us meet those goals. As I just mentioned, there is much already happening to disrupt the traditional delivery of medical care, and employers are interested in seeing much more. So what will this new form of innovation and disruption look like? Let's look at a healthy population, our first goal. As we've heard today earlier, primary care is fundamental to improving the health of our population, and employers are paying attention to the new models of primary care delivery um, that are improving the health of our population. We hope that disrupting the primary care system will drive improvements in prevention, coordination of care, and health outcomes. Startups and provider groups are creating next-gen primary care centers that allow for more time with patients, allow for same-day appointments, are integrated with other types of services, and are helping manage chronic diseases. Employers will be increasingly partnering with primary care groups and vendors that deliver a better experience through a coordinated use of data, technology, nurses, and mid-level practitioners. In behavioral health, this is becoming increasingly important for American businesses. Many Americans deal with untreated mental health and substance abuse disorders, and employers are looking for solutions to help provide better mental health for our employees. These unchecked issues can have a significant impact on physical health and productivity, so we're evaluating a wide range of tools and programs to help those in need of care. 
Some new forms of behavioral health care will utilize telephonic or video therapy. Others may be app-based treatments or use wearable technology to monitor stress and anxiety. But whatever the form is, employers are very interested in bring, bringing these new solutions to the workforce. And connected devices, as I've mentioned a few times now, technology is playing a big role in the healthcare programs that we offer our employees. Mobile phones and digital devices are helping treat patients by collecting data, providing real-time communications, um, and providing uh, remote monitoring. And we're excited to see what other types of services will emerge in the future. So turning to our next goal, an improved experience in the healthcare system. As I mentioned earlier, employers are using advocacy or navigator programs to guide employees throughout the healthcare system, and I imagine there'll be a continued innovation in this space. As these programs evolve and become even more impactful, employers are interested in ensuring that patients who need medical care are going to the most appropriate provider. It won't be enough to recommend a treatment option for a patient. We will want to see that an individual's medical needs get matched to a highly, uh, to a high quality specific provider. By using data-driven approaches to recommend and patients match up with the right provider and treatment, we're going to see improved outcomes and cost, which brings me back to controlling costs. Employers, and many others, are eagerly anticipating the arrival of new market entrants. A survey of about 170 large employers this past summer by the National Business Group of Health showed they are very, employers, large employers are very optimistic about the ent new entrants coming to the market. Um, employers have watched and partnered with new entrants quite extensively over the recent past, and, and I expect that conti to continue. Whether it's the Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan Venture, or some other startup that has yet to surface, employers are willing and able to kick the tires of disruption. It is possible that we will see some other um, some other large disintermediary work with us to actually create some sort of disruption. And it's probable, it is probable in the pharmacy supply chain or in the design and structure of health plans themselves that we'll see some other disruption. And the recent approved mergers of two sets of health plans and pharmacy managers has the possibility to bring more disruption and innovative experience into the delivery of health care. It's too early to say how these new arrangements will impact the triple aim in the near future, but rest assured, employers will be very interested. Next generation health plans. So most large employers have encouraged changes to how health plans operate either through collaboration or um, direct encouragement. I see that expanding in the near future as employers push for new models of medical insurance and disruption will occur as employers work with health plans to test out new payment mechanisms, preferably those that put a greater emphasis on managing health and improving value. Moving beyond unit cost to tying payments to quality metrics and efficiency measures will be an important model that employers will flock to. Whether it is called value-based care or something else, employers will be instrumental in pursuing strategies that deliver improved cost and better quality and outcomes. And lastly, just a few comments about data. The amount of data in healthcare is growing, but it doesn't always mean that we have better patient outcomes or experiences. <clears throat> this is due in part to the fragmentation of the data itself. Useful healthcare data is spread out by location, format, and structure, and it continues to be siloed. This makes it difficult for providers and health plans to use data in meaningful ways. So we want to see what will happen when wide sets of data combine to enable next generation analytics and artificial intelligence. We're optimistic that in an effort to have a complete view of the patient, this information can and will be aggregated and shared. There's so many players in the healthcare world holding on to their own data. We need to combine clinical, demographic, and claims data to fully meet the triple aim. And to close, along with the rise in innovation comes with it the increasing responsibility of employers to curate and offer the best solutions for their businesses. While we seek to optimize the health of our employees and, the families and their families, we'll continue to seek out and encourage innovation and disruption. Employers will be a part of the solution. Ultimately, we're looking for programs that employees find valuable, drive satisfaction, and are measurable in improving outcomes, and are having a positive financial impact for our organization. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bob Kocher. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, AEI, for convening us. 
Thank you, Jim Capretta and Joe Antos, for a great panel, for proving to be a really engaging discussion. I'm proud to be here. I come here perhaps as the most optimistic person you'll hear from today. Over the last eight years, we've had, I believe, a renaissance, actually, in creativity and imagination uh, applied to healthcare. And the fact that Mario and Hill are sitting here, they came from gaming. They were the people that were engaging us on our phones to play Candy Crush, and they gave that up to come apply their skills to make healthcare suck less. And that is a great thing. Coupled with that, we've seen for each of the last five years more venture capital dollars, more private equity dollars, and more startups created in healthcare than ever before. Healthcare venture capital on the delivery side was like, was like Siberia for 15 years before the ACA because there was nothing to do. We had incumbents, they were paying fee for service, we didn't have a computer, and nothing was happening. And now we have a myriad of people attacking this from every different angle, and people like us on adopting it and showing that it can work. And so those conditions are right. And it's a combination of talent and capital coupled to changes to incentives to how we pay and to information. And those are the rocket fuel that are actually driving us forward. And so it is going to be OK. It's going to take longer than you think. All right, so here's the story. Over the last eight years, there's been more change than most people have perceived actually happening in American healthcare. Access has improved. More people have actually access. Demand for services have grown. There's companies that are derivative of that, things like Oscar and Devoted Health, that are now serving those people. Costs, while they're a massive problem, they're less bad than they were before. It's growing slower, which means that some of this stuff is actually leading to some change. And on quality, while it's very hard to measure, the way we measure it makes us think that it's getting somewhat better. And so I would say there's lots of bright spots. It's not an unsolved problem for how you could lower premiums in America, and I'll talk some about what you can do. We could fund reinsurance and high-risk pools to pull out some of the most costly people to make the average premium much, much lower. We could do marketing. Marketing works. We could actually bring more people into the risk pool to make the risk pool better. Uh, we could re-explore mandates of different types and levels and auto-enrollment. I think states will actually be great laboratories for this. And we can think about how to make the market work. We heard from Mario uh, about the challenges that, that he faces when patients are, you know, get engulfed by the system and what the cost differences are. And Hassan's talked a bit about, from the employer perspective, the things that they try to do to mitigate hospital market power. But the hitch is most Americans live by a hospital, and that's where they go. And that hospital, therefore, has a lot of, pr a lot of power over pricing. And then the regulatory things like the network definitions for what you have to have for access leads to lots of market power for hospitals. These are things that are proven to lower premiums. There are a bunch of things we could do that may lower premiums. This is my wish list for policymakers. Uh, we could keep going down the path of new payment models, but we have to index them to something different than medical inflation, or you won't actually save any money. Uh, we can tackle drug costs, but I'm not sure that this posting prices that nobody pays is going to be the solution. Uh, End-of-life care is inartfully done and costs too much and, and doesn't honor either the patient wishes or the dignity of anybody taking part in the care. Preventative care works, but the problem is our current models don't reward it because you're only in a health plan for a year or two. If you're in an ACO, we care about your costs only this year. That's the benchmark here. We make care for a three-year period and a longer benchmark period, but we don't care about long-term health. We have no way today to pay for that. Whether that's preventative care or things like curing hepatitis C, we, we, deal, we have a hard time dealing with any cost that's spread out for more than a year. And the medical malpractice reform is the first thing doctors tend to ask me after I talk about, like, you know, isn't the defensive practice of medicine a giant problem? And while we can debate how big a problem it is, if we reform it, we could make <laughs> like one step forward towards making the system act more rationally. So with that as the backdrop, let me talk about like, what's happening now, kind of the view from the venture capital West Coast. The first thing I would say is that the, the problem is healthcare costs the same as a Toyota Corolla every year for American families. It's, it's insane to quote Mario Schlosser's slide from, the, from this morning. It costs 19,000 bucks for a family of four. That, that is unaffordable. Even worse, you pay $19,000, and then you arrive with a one, two, three, five thousand dollars $5,000 deductible when you start, and then nobody tells you the prices. And so the whole thing, we can't afford. It will crowd out everything else in the budget, things that we care a lot about, whether it's education or prisons or roads or defense. It crowds out everything else. It also crowds out the consumer economy, which is what drives America, and it's the source of much of our productivity. The other hitch is that it's been the job creator. We've had this horrible recession and a prolonged recovery, the white bars are BLS employment data of healthcare jobs 
We have employed new people in the healthcare sector for every month since BLS has kept the data. The, the economy shed 8 million jobs in the recession. We never stopped hiring in healthcare. You recall we didn't expand coverage until 2010. We hired in, in advance of that. The most troubling part is that hospital demand in this period has been flat. And so it's not like there was a whole bunch more happening that you needed a lot more people. We just added people. When you go down one level further and you unpack the people, more than half of them have been administrative. So this is the only sector in the economy that's managed to add more non-productive labor relative to productive labor. That means that in aggregate, we're not productive and we're very expensive. And we're going to have to do something about that. We have to apply technology to get that productivity back. And some of those jobs are going to go away. And that's going to be really, really hard. What's going to drive that? It's the new payment models. Thankfully, payment model reform is something that Democrats and Republicans agree a lot about. Congress passed the macro legislation, which got rid of the horrendous SGR program, 92 to 8. The Senate did. Seema Verma has been a champion for pushing forward on new payment models, whether it's revamping the ACO program to make it more risk-based, pushing MA forward. Uh, the Innovation Center has promulgated new models for MA and primary care. And they made the, they, they, they made the incentives for doctors very, very strong. If you're a doctor in 2019, you get a 5% bonus just for signing up for a new payment model, which means that you will. 5% bonuses in healthcare are hard to find. And as we do that, that unleashes that imagination to redesign care in the ways that Clint talked about. There are concerns that we need to think about with new payment models. One is they're zero sum. So that money comes from somewhere. That money usually comes from a hospital. So hospitals, as you can imagine, are concerned, terrified, uncertain about what's going to happen as these things get rolled out. They lead to fewer specialist visits, as Mario showed. When, when there's payment model changes, both on the demand side and the supply side, downstream consumption is different. While direct primary care is an awesome way to engage the patients, they do send people less often to specialists. That's often good because I can treat a lot of things in my office. But there's fewer specialist visits. There's fewer sniff days. Uh, there's different drug choices. And so much work has to be done also to make sure we're not stinting on care. And so part of the benefits of EHRs, despite many of the, the, the pains that come with them, is it allows you to extract data and information to figure out, are patients getting actually better care, not just cheaper care? I worry about undertreatment. I also um, am excited by the fact that primary doctors will be much more empowered and better off in these models. But when you step back, you can cut healthcare by, it costs too much because there's too many people. The other way to think about it is the sick people we have cost us a, a lot of money. Only 10% of American citizens' Medicare data are about 60% of the cost. And so as much as we'd like to redesign care to make it more delightful and more like you know, Netflix and Uber for, for you and I, uh, it's the people that are dreadfully sick that we have to change the care for because they're the ones that spend all the money every year. Interestingly, it's not just the year they die. The year you die, it's very, very expensive. But actually, if you're a chronic comorbid patient, you have years that are very expensive for decades. And it's how we change care for that cohort of Americans that will have the greatest impact on actually our federal health care dollars. When you take apart the pricing, this is Medicare data, uh, most of the costs are in the hospital. So thinking about how to redesign care to be in the home, in the primary care office, or frankly anywhere else, is a way to save a bunch of money. Because after in the hospital, the hospital makes you so sick that then you go to another hospital called a SNF, where they then hopefully try to make you better. And so there's a lot that you have to do to redesign the system such that these people spend less time in a hospital. Hospitals discoordinate care, they lead to delirium, and it's very, very unsafe. So the question is, who is better at lowering hospital costs? Is it the hospitals and the health systems that we've just seen bulking up and buying doctors and calling themselves systems? Or is it something else? And the data actually now is quite clear. It's primary care physicians are the, are the solution here. And we heard about this from Clint. That very interestingly, we are going back towards a world that's more like this. In the last five years, there's been an, a flurry of companies that are actually doing house calls again, sending doctors to your home, and it can be very cost-effective if the patient's quite sick. Uh, it's extraordinary how often a, a house call of both identifies new problems that, were, that we were not aware of when you came to the office, as well as um, is able to administer medicines that keep you from going to the ER and then to the hospital. You can't get into the hospital if you don't go to an ER, and a house call is a great way to avert many of those visits. This is data from the recent ACO regulation that Medicare put out, and it showed really, really um, confirmatory data, which is what Medicare calls low-revenue ACOs, which are physician-led ACOs, relative to high-revenue hospital-led ACOs, that the doctors saved a lot more money than the hospitals. 
In interestingly, these small business groups, the independent primary care doctors, saved even more money than the next gen more large, large multi specialty cap data providers. And this is great news because creating more low revenue physician led ACOs is not hard. We have a lot of groups in the country that can, can adopt this, and there's now more than 1,100 ACOs in the country and 30 million Medicare beneficiaries in the program. And you can see it can work when the doctors are in charge. Looking forward, the reason I'm optimistic is that I have no doubt the technology and the information that we're liberating today will strip out enormous cost. PCPs will grow in power, and that is good for patients. We've heard from Clint. I mean, it, it, you can do a lot if you just start at the PCP. The rationalization of our infrastructure is going to be incredibly painful and political. Hospitals are the largest employer in virtually every town in the country, including San Francisco, and they've been adding jobs. We have more beds than we need. No matter how you play forward the demographic models in the country, the rate at which we're taking days out of hospitals through better primary care, new payment models, and new technology, new medicines, is faster than the rate at which we're aging. So demand is not going to go up. And hospitals are only 55% full today in America. As this happens, care is going to get better. It will get more personalized. It will remember. It will all the same things that have made every other part of our economy that technology has touched make it actually easier to access, it will get better in healthcare too. And there's an amazing opportunity to untangle the administrative costs that go between the faxes that are being passed forth in 14 days between payers and providers. Our focus as investors is going after how do we attack wasteful spending. Thank God there's a ton of it, $910 billion a year. And our themes are basically asking ourselves, how can we get the money out quickly? So we look for a 12-month return on investment for companies that are going to serve up new, 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 uh, new innovations into healthcare. Because if you're paying for healthcare, you, you can't afford to wait. You're paying so much. The other hitch is that in healthcare, despite $3.3 trillion spent, nobody but the pharma companies have any margins. So you have to be able to pay for yourself right away. We like the full stack, you know, take full risk approach. I think it's much better to control the entire experience and product as opposed to give somebody a dashboard or an analytical tool that hopefully you know, inspires them to do something differently. Uh, delivering the service, we think, is very, very important. And we think that software and AI will take out a bunch of costs, but it will be first on the admin side before we take out the, the clinical, before we really transform the clinical side. With that, I want to thank you, and I look forward to a great discussion. So I'm Joe Antos with AEI, and I want to thank our speakers for uh, yeah, interesting presentations. Uh, <clears throat> um, only, I, as far as I could tell, only one person was actually trying to get people to sign up, but I'm pretty sure everybody already has their coverage here. So uh, I think you're probably addressing the internet audience. How is this better? Yeah, exa <laughs> exactly. Uh, the um, it, you know, it's it's it is interesting. Um, uh, the uh, sort of variations here that, that we heard. Um, uh, uh, Mario represents what I would consider to be a, a full service insurer, uh, but uh, uh, not operating like the typical insurance company, uh, or at least so he claims. All insurance companies claim that they use data. Uh, uh, you know, it remains to be seen how they use data and uh, whether uh, uh, their, uh, the use of data actually leads to financial results. Yep. Um, uh, obviously, we also care about the health of the patient. That really matters. Uh, but when you get right down to it, uh, what drives innovation in this country? It's the possibility of profit. If you can't make a profit, uh, then you're not going to have the innovation that, that you want. Um, and that, that really <laughs> raises a big question because, you know, Jim, uh, starting this off, pointed out um, uh, that we have 30% uh, or some people claim that we have 30% waste uh, in our health system. Um, uh, and, yes, that is an opportunity. But that 30% waste also <coughs> represents uh, the incomes of a lot of people. We are, our health system is really locked into, has made a big investment in wasteful provision of healthcare services. And, and, and there are more of them 
than, regrettably, than there are of you and, and people like yourselves. So, so breaking through that barrier is going to be, I think, very, very difficult. And I think part of, part of the discussion that I hope we have is, how do you do that? Uh, what were those barriers? Uh, what are the barriers that you still uh, face and, and, and that sort of thing? Um, so um, <clears throat> maybe we ought to start off. Uh, actually, I always like to uh, get people to uh, raise questions uh, uh, among themselves about what works and doesn't work. But this panel may not be that amenable to, to that issue. Um, the, um, so maybe the other approach would be to uh, talk about uh, this question about uh, the different roles of actors in the health system. So uh, we, we heard from uh, Hassan uh, a little bit about the role of, of employers. And um, uh, you know, we see plenty of examples. Uh, Hassan mentioned uh, uh, an example outside of his personal uh, company, but also the Pacific Business Group on Health uh, partnered with us to do an event uh, a couple months ago where we heard from mostly very large employers uh, about um, things that they were doing to try to chip away at, at the costs that they were facing. And that's really what's driving them. It's the cost that they're facing uh, that, that's a real problem. Uh, <clears throat> I guess one question is, uh, do we really expect employers to take an active role in that, given that most employers are not in the health business? Most employers are in the X business, whatever that is, and, uh, and their HR directors typically are not health experts either. They're probably more comfortable talking about pension plans than they are about health plans. Uh, so, so to what extent do we think employers are going to be able to take a lead here? Uh, let's start, start with anybody who wants to try to address that. Mr. Employer. <laughs> um, so you're. Oh. Uh, so you're right. Not not every employer wants to get involved in, in modifying and shifting the the healthcare uh, system. Um, and we we are not healthcare providers. We're a food distributor. I have to remind myself every day. But we spend a lot of money on healthcare, and healthcare impacts our employees every day. Um, it, Healthcare or employers actually um, work in coalitions and actually will combine and address uh, common issues regionally and nationally. So there are a number of employer coalitions that are working together. So whether it's a small employer that doesn't have um, internal healthcare expertise, they actually actually join a coalition. There are some here in Washington D.C. and I'm in Chicago. We have a, a very prominent one. We're working um, side by side with other employers. So it's an effective and um, kind of useful way to get the, the message out. So, so but the, the other part of that is that while some employers want to be active, the question is, uh, uh, is, is the better strategy to, uh, go to go to an employer and say, Here, here's, here's a solution that might work, as opposed to thinking that employers are going to take the lead? I'm happy to chime in there. Yeah. Do you need me to take the microphone? Okay. Uh, so we we do go to we do go to employers, uh, and uh, you know whether it's a company of ten or a company of five thousand, we target employers and we look at uh, the existing system as we should we really should encourage a redesign of the current benefit offering. Oftentimes, the health benefit spend is the second highest cost outside of payroll for employers. They're spending a lot of money. So if you think about it, they really should have a fiduciary responsibility to the amount of money, especially their employees' money and their money that's being spent. Uh, so uh, when you see double-digit increases year after year in the amount of spend, yet the care's not getting better, we look at that as an opportunity for, well, maybe we could redesign that. The challenge is there are a lot of players on that front. You have the HR teams, you have C-suite, and you have the owners, you have brokers. Uh, and, and so we're coming in as essentially physicians and saying we think we you know, have a solution for your self-funded plan, your level-funded plan, your fully, fully insured plan, and that solution is to front your company with direct primary care. Some of our companies have zero benefit for their employees, for example, less than 20 employees. Other companies have pretty robust benefit, uh, and especially if you're in a self-funded plan, you know, that there's a significant amount of spend that's happening, and a lot of times it's like giving your employee a credit card to just go spend, right, with hardly any direction. 
So we say, who better to help provide some of that direction than your doctor, your primary care doctor, number right. one. And as physicians, we take an oath, this Hippocratic oath to do no harm. And in what we do in direct primary care, we like to take that a step further. So we should try and do no financial harm. Uh, every time a physician writes an order, there's a cost associated with that, right? Who better to help and know those costs than your doctor? So if I can write for a medicine that's going to cost you $2 per month for your blood pressure uh, uh, concerns, and they'll keep your pressure down, versus a medicine that's going to cost $200 a month, uh, you know, those kind of details and intricacies are, are oftentimes best known by the physician whose his interest isn't so much how am I going to pay my stockholders, you know, his interest is how am I going to help best take care of my patients. So, so we realize in America a lot of patient, people are getting their benefit from their employer or their coverage, let's say, these days. And so we make it a point to target the employers directly. And oftentimes they are quite uh, sophisticated, but sometimes not. Okay, sometimes so there's no benefit. Bob, uh, or uh, Mario and then Bob. Yeah, from my point of view, I'm not sure we should be the ones deciding that question. We should simply give the freedom into the market to decide on that question and yeah. differently by employer by employer. There are some employers who I'm sure are very engaged in, in their employees' health care and who should play that role. And there are others who think, I run a different business. I shouldn't be in the business of right. being a health insurance company, essentially. Um, and right now, the issue is the system that we have locks employers into not having that choice, really. They can't really take those pre-tax dollars give them to their employees and say, here, you go buy your own benefits, your own individual market plans, whatever other plans they can get. There's some, there's some rulemaking right now happening among the regulatory bodies, among the feds, um, that might lead to that. And I'm hoping that that will come really uh, to the forefront and work out. Uh, but that's a step we ought to be taking. A couple of issues I want to point out with the collective action problem, um, if employers bundle large uh, pools of risk, one is, again, the question of networks. Many of the issues I think we're seeing in the U.S. healthcare system do come back to the fact that unit costs are way too high. Unit costs are high because there isn't much competition on the value chain, as I, as I pointed out. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if, if we, for example, saw in New York City where we had a broad network that we rented as an insurance company in 2016 and switched to a custom-built, more selective network design in 2017, what happened there? Our unit costs came down by 30%. So Oscomers can now get 30% lower hospital care, for example. That's about half the spends that goes into medical loss ratio in a given year. Um, uh, but in about two-thirds of the membership stuck around. The other third had a physician who was with the hospital that was leaving the network. That's a good trade to make for a lot of members. Again, two-thirds of the people in any given geography are okay with basically switch, you know, having a physician already that is in, remains in the network at a lower cost then. But there are some people who would want to choose another network. That is a difficult uh, kind of uh, logic and architecture to build for an employer, but can be built if you allow for more individual choice. The other issue I think you have is the lack of portability across some um, sort of like healthcare journeys as an individual. Um, people are dropping in and out of employers. They're dropping in and out of the, out of the individual market even. For, we probably have members on average for about two or three years on membership base. If we knew that we were able to invest in somebody over a period of 10, 20, 30 years, you know, we would sequence everybody's genome um, and predict uh, your cardiovascular disease risk 10 years from now is start investing in you today to try to mitigate the risk you will have 10 years down the line. Uh, right now, uh, no insurer can really fully do that. Um, I think they could all do more than they're doing right now, and we're starting to do that as well. But you can't really fully do that until we are to, at a point where I can have my insurance and I can port it and I can port my data between the various sort of like stations in life that I have. And in, in some shape or form, we got to get to that point, um, and I think that's, uh, you know, Amazon, if I made it connected to, that, connected to that a little bit, they will face that same issue. They've got 45,000 employees in Seattle. That's not a lot of employees to have um, to negotiate right. narrow network deals and risk sharing deals and things like that in one geography as big as Seattle. Uh, and so, um, you know, you just, you won't get everything coming from, from kind of that point of view. You need more portability and more freedom of choice, I think, for the employees as well. Right. The yeah. reason why employers are really interesting is that Every employee, when they walk onto a provider, is like a, a billionaire walking into Nima Marcus. So employers are paying 30, 40, 50% higher prices for the same exact service as Medicare and 80% and, and more in some cases than Medicaid. And as I mentioned, the hospitals and the doctors and the pharmacies and the SNFs, they have low margins. They make 3, 5, 8% EBITDA margins. They're thrilled if they can make 8%. Almost all of that margin comes from the 
tiny number. They, they may be third of the patients that are from employers. And so if just a few employees of large employers choose not to walk into one health system but choose another, it decimates the profits of that place and makes them very responsive. And so employers have a bunch of power if they choose to use it. It's been hard for a couple reasons. One is that um, health plans have not served them well by offering them these super broad networks, saying, like, everybody's in it. Well, if everybody's in it, well, there's not a lot of negotiation that's going on. Uh, number two, most employees are pretty healthy. So Amazon's going to be disappointed when they kind of negotiate in Seattle with the hospitals because they have 45,000 people who are 35 years old. So they only have newborn deliveries. That's all they got. Like, they don't have a lot to negotiate with. Uh, and so employers have this challenge that they have healthy populations. Uh, and then health plans have had this challenge of churn of members, and so they don't bother to think about like seven years from now. Part of the reason why Medicare Advantage is so exciting, and you're seeing many new entrants come into that space, is that the people stay in those plans for seven, eight, nine years. And over that duration, you can actually do things to prevent caring and get down. Like flu shots are cost effective when you give it to those populations. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, the you know this question of disruption, I think, is an interesting one, and I, I guess I don't see a lot of disruption in, in in you know big bold capital letters. I see adjustments to uh, the system that we now have. I mean, uh, I, I, Mario, for example, uh, uh, Oscar Health had, had the distinct advantage of uh, entering a market. Uh, along with other other firms, of course, but entering a market uh, of people who uh, virtually by definition didn't have a personal physician. So <clears throat> you're creating a network, perhaps a more efficient network, perhaps a more organized network, uh, but nonetheless it was a little bit easier because you were going into a niche of the market that had had either been overlooked by traditional insurers or uh, lower income people who who uh, uh, or maybe healthier people as well, who just weren't tied to the health sector uh, 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 like most of the people in this room. <clears throat> so, so that's it. That's a disruption. But it's what is in a part of the market that was already, in essence, disrupted compared to the other seventy-five percent of the market. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, with networks, I see the other two gentlemen. Uh, who, who uh, you know, Doctors in Demand and Xterra, they're really talking about recreating networks uh, in one way or another. And that makes a lot of sense um, uh, if you can get uh, the consumers to go along with that. But if they're already locked into a, a frame of mind that hasn't already been disrupted, uh, then it's hard to do. So, so uh, you know, the disruption might, in fact, have been moving to a high deductible insurance. And you stepped into that space, just as Oscar stepped into a space because suddenly uh, there was funding for uh, coverage uh, for people who previously didn't have it. Uh, um, uh, you know, Bob is very enthusiastic about ACOs. Uh, as are you. Uh, yeah, I really am. Uh, <clears throat> but, but, you know, uh, the Medicare program, in fact, uh, has been as much uh, a problem as, as any program uh, in terms of having this short-term viewpoint. Uh, it's beginning to change a little bit, but, but that's, I think, more talk than it is action. Uh, after all, the only way you can leave Medicare is the well, inevitable way. one way, way yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you're, so potentially Medicare as a program should be looking at people from a 20- or 30-year perspective. For, for sure that's, we need a longer person. Well, let me just make a <laughs> Yeah. The, the arbitrage in the networks in America are unbelievable. So Mario showed the slide of a three different variation in cost. And no matter how you cut that, there's always a scatter plot that you can always find better health care that's lower cost. And that's also true within the expensive hospital. So there are times you want to use the high-priced academic medical center. But when you go inside of it, I work at Stanford. And at Stanford, we have a bunch of doctors. Every one of them is insanely ex expensive. But some of them are good. And so you want to actually have information about how to route within that. Because when you buy access to a health system, you unfortunately today have to buy all of it. And you can't today, like they don't in the negotiations allow you to sort of put gold stars by just the good ones. So you need some, some other secret way to help you figure out like which doctor you actually need to go to inside of that thing. And that arbitrage is enormous, both in the outcome that you get and in the total cost that you'll pay even though the units are all expensive. And so what Oscar has done and what Dr. Naman does and I'm sure what, what Next Era does is they actually have people who are expert help you know, oh, no, no, like 
at, at this place, this is the person for that. Yeah. And they actually do that. And that information now is available through EHRs and claims. And you need an intermediary to help do that process. Patients, in my experience, are less anxious and delighted when you can say, actually, for your cancer, this is the right person, not like choose from the big, big broad, broad list. And so what's great is that there's this enormous arbitrage in how you access the network. And then you can actually have a broad network like Medicare as long as you use just the good parts of it. And that's where I think a bunch of the innovations is happening right now and gives me a lot of optimism. ACOs is one way to do that. NMA, you see capitated providers do it. These guys do it well for employers. And so that, it's more subtle. I mean, it's not like United Healthcare goes away. It's like we use the network very differently. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, I mean, one of the things that Hill said that really struck with me, uh, whether the percentage is really correct, but 80% of health problems can be handled by a primary care doc, and in particular, uh, uh, many of those problems can be handled, in, indeed, not face-to-face. -face. Uh, 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 in many cases, what the patient needs to know is, what do I do next? Right. You know, you don't necessarily need a prescription. You need to know, what do I do next? I think, I think most of the people in this room, anybody who's have kid, kids, have experienced that, and it's very hard to get that information. That's right. Well, that's also, that's also true for the older population as well. And, and Medicare is, is lagging way behind. So, uh, you know, we'll be looking forward to these innovations being introduced to the Medicare program sometime. In yeah, just, just to build on that point, I mean, so much of what Hassan was talking about, all the different point solutions he contracts with as an employer, um, from the second opinions to the, you know, the um, um, chronic disease management programs, the telemedicine, they all exist for one single problem, which there's not enough of these guys around. There's not enough access to primary care. And so um, in some ways, we're trying to solve that problem in very different ways. Um, we're trying to use technology to scale the model, to effectively scale a doctor so that anyone, no matter where you live, um, has access to that, to that primary care physician. And I think if you do that well, so much of the rest of it takes care of itself downstream. Now, I, now I've had a question about payment as well. Uh, you know, we're, everybody knows that fee-for-service is evil. Uh, but everybody also knows, if they think about it, that uh, essentially uh, all health operations operate uh, at some level at a fee-for-service level. So how do you get the incentives to get all the way down to the physician who, uh, other than a salaried physician, which doesn't happen very often, most physicians, in fact, are rewarded for uh, production. So, so we're, how do you see that changing, and, and how would you apply that to federal, federal programs? I'm happy to speak a bit on that. So having lived in the fee-for-service primary care world for many years as an employee, as an employee of a large health system and having owned uh, practices, so private primary care practices. The disruption, as you mentioned earlier, you know, where's the disruption, where's the innovation? The disruption that we did back years ago is we said, we're not going to pay primary care doctors based upon that visit with, with the patient. So currently, that's the way things happen. United, Anthem, Metna, Blue Cross pay the primary care doctor for that visit. And that's why doctors see 25, 35 patients per day. In direct primary care, the doctor's paid monthly. So they're paid per member per month. When a patient selects their doctor, that doctor's paid the Netflix membership or the gym membership, uh, essentially less overhead. Uh, and so whether the doctor takes care of that patient face-to-face -face in the high overhead office or whether the doctor uses technology, 21st century technology, to do a virtual visit, uh, the doctors pay the same amount, so there's no incentive to bring the patient in. So now you're actually removing that barrier of you got to take off work to go into the doctor's office to uh, have a transaction in the $30 copay. That goes away. And so now you have uh, patients connecting with their physician versus connecting to Dr. Google, right? And they're getting their questions answered not a month from now. They're getting their questions and concerns answered now and 50 to 70% of primary care and urgent care can be done virtually. The reason in the fee-for-service world we don't do it for the most part is because we don't get paid for it. So we've now disrupted and removed the payment piece of fee-for-service. Fee-for-service should pay for your stent, but it should not pay for primary care. Uh, and we tried that experiment for decades, and it didn't work. And so we need to get to a place in this country where, like other countries, where we have about two-thirds primary care and about one-third specialty care. We're, we're not there. Other countries that are there have closed hospitals and got rid of administrators and 
shrunk budgets and those types of things. So it's a process. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, you had to, you know, we didn't try to add bricks to an existing building that was uh, crumbling. We built a new building. Uh, and that new building is direct primary care. And while it's not going to be the only solution, there are many of us physicians in the country that uh, uh, think it is. And at a time, you know, when we started doing this, there was about a few of us across the country. Now about every state in the country has direct primary care physicians. Just want to point out uh, that um, I'm from an 18,000 person town in Germany, and that's exactly how the doctors they get paid. So, um, so my PCB in Germany got paid a monthly stipend. Uh, as a result, he spends half of his day on a bicycle visiting oh, his old patients in their homes because he'd rather not have them show up and you know sit in their waiting room, his waiting room all day long. And so uh, these incentives can be changed. And in a sense, this disruption we're looking for, I think, to some degree, goes back to the roots with the technology bends. One additional point. Um, as a sort of like physician system is shifting that we're noticing as well is when we look at some certain quality metrics, you know, kind of colorectal cancer screening rates or hemoglobin A1C kind of tracking how well physicians are doing it with the patients that they have. We can see these things with a bird's eye view for our physicians because we get the claims and things like that. What we see is that there is a dispersion maybe like, like this uh, around physician on a physician by physician basis and a dispersion that's like this on a practice by practice basis. Mm -hmm. What that implies is that um, the workflows and technologies and data systems that you need to become better at this kind of customer relationship management um, in terms of keeping track of the patient's risk and how they're doing, what they got to do next and so on, they take investments. And, and so um, uh, in, in a sense, uh, we're at the moment in the worst of both worlds, where on the one hand, if you're a primary care physician, you're either gobbled up by a hospital which means you largely become a referral feeder, um, you know, in the worst case, or you're totally on your own, in which case you probably can't invest enough in, in building the technology to make sure you, take, you, you keep track of your patients in, in a great way. And so, again, the models sort of like that really are in the middle where you bundle physicians, go more direct, and get different reimbursements from the insurance company. I think that's what's needed and what's powerful. That and, and feedback. Back feedback. to the and providers. The, all the data links that you need, of course, yeah, for that right, as well. Exactly. exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, everyone wants to improve what they do, yeah. and if they if they know that they're lagging behind, which is hard to hard to figure out at this point, yeah. uh, it's uh, it's possible that you can yep. find a way. Absolutely. Jen, yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I, I just as I've heard the discussion, it's been very interesting to think about what the, your reactions to, and maybe this might put Hassan more on the spot, but I, I want to hear from all of you is you know, a lot of the dollars are locked up in, in big institutional programs where the consumer doesn't play a very big role. So you have the employer-based system where a lot of times the employer is making decisions on behalf of big groups of employees. And in the Medicare program, separate from the Medicare Advantage component, you know, most of the beneficiaries are enrolled in still the traditional fee-for-service program where there isn't, and they, they often, very often have wraparound insurance associated with it. They're fairly passive when they're in that environment in terms of being an active seeker of, you know, disruptive innovation, so to speak, right? So uh, I, I guess I want to hear from the group, you know, is, is one of the key to accelerating disruption and innovation and being able to tailor all of the different kinds of services that might make costs go down and quality go up, would it help to unlock the money and allow the consumer to control it more? Bob may have a little different take on this, and you know, I'm not sure what your takes would be on this, because you know, healthcare is different. There is always going to be regulations protecting consumers, but isn't one of the big things holding all of this back the fact that the consumer doesn't control most of the money? I can say, I mean, it's abs that's ex exactly what I believe. I think that um, if the employers were given the choice, to say, I'm taking the money I'm giving you right now and giving to a health plan or to a third party administrator or whatever else, and simply says to the employee, you take that pretax money, you go, go, go buy a plan, the exchange or a plan you know, elsewhere, uh, it would at least open the avenue for that pressure to start building in the system. Again, not every employer would then do that, and some employers might be great at managing healthcare, um, but there are plenty of employers who would then simply say, okay, great, I'm in a geography where there are great choices, I'll, I'll engender more choice. Um, by doing this, and this should happen. This is what I keep telling Amazon, that they should, uh, you know, they should go build whatever they want to build. I mean, let, let them do that. So it's nice to see some more innovation there. But the first thing they should do is they should go to CMS. They should say, guys, give me the chance to just do this, open up my employees 
to take HRA money, HSA money, whatever else, invest directly into individual plants and let them buy that. And then let's see who likes what. And over a period of three years, you watch who buys which plan, how they stick with it, what the retention rates are, and what the, and the promoter scores are, and you see where we land. And my, my thesis would be that um, that's sort of like what unseated the, the BlackBerry versus the iPhone. You know, the, I, the BlackBerry was largely sold to corporations and had a whole infrastructure behind it um, that's really sold to CIOs and companies. Um, and when the iPhone came around uh, and was a great consumer experience, first and foremost, the pressure started building and eventually, you know, kind of toppled the way the system used to look. Uh, again, healthcare, you can't leave everything up to the consumer in healthcare. Um, otherwise, we have to erase the bottom from a deductive point of view, benefits point of view, and things like that. We need certain essential health benefits built into plans. I'm a big believer of that. Uh, but around that, there's a lot more freedom we can create. So... I think we should implement the Cadillac tax, and we should work to try to create less of a giant incentive for employers to be the aggregator and purchaser. Uh, but I, I think that much more impact will come on the payment reform on the supply side because of the information asymmetry. If you think about our healthcare spending, there's that 10% of patients that are super expensive, and they're spending $70,000 a year. No American's bank account can absorb that sort of empowerment that you give them, because they, they, don't, they don't have the, a way to pay for this. The drugs that they're using are going to cost 20000 bucks, growing at 10% a year. The hospital bed days, like, we have good metrics about avoidable bed days, but when you're the patient in the bed, you, you can't avoid that day. And so the people that I think have the most leverage information is actually the primary care doctor, who, when incentivized to think about total cost of care, can do, I mean, we've heard from Clint, like, all the things, think about all the things he does differently. And so I believe that actually the payment reform on the supply side ends up being more important because of the asymmetric information. Patients have multiple diseases. When you're actually having a manifestation of your disease, you're probably not as capable to shop it logically as you would on, on any other day. Uh, and it's really regressive because... We can debate like how much lifestyle affects disease, but your genetics is a really important component. And so if you tell somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis, well, you're empowered. Every year you have to like somehow manage that $20,000 bill that unfortunately God's endowed you with. Like it, it, they have nothing they can do. Like the, the, the medicines are too expensive and, and the doctors have too much information. And so I think you need to have more demand side incentive. Like the fact that Mario showed a picture uh, people who choose to go to high-cost doctors that don't make them happy and don't fire them, well, that's a problem. Like you, you'd like to have people know that like you're getting a bad, you're getting bad, you know, a bad experience. There's a better choice. But every time we've tried in Medicare and commercial insurance to sort of do transparency, it actually hasn't sort of led to that giant market share shift. What has led to greater shifts has been the primary care payment reform side. You see much quicker changes in consumption when you capitate a doctor. They, they suddenly learn how to treat AFib again in their office. They, they don't use the ER. They open up on Saturday. They use telemedicine. It, it happens much more dramatically. And so I think you have to couple the two. It would be great for people to have more data. Uh, and when you give them more data, often through a navigator or through a second opinion service, they do change their doctor. You know, nobody wants to go to the doctor that's going to treat you badly and not be high quality. But the system itself relies too much on somebody figuring that out. And we as clinicians have done a great job at confusing you because we report metrics that are only in Latin. We only report on a few diseases. We make the data you know, 18 months behind, and Medicare often reports it as not different than the average unless you're in the bottom 5%. And so we haven't made it any easier either. Right. I like the use of the word data as opposed to information. Yeah. Information would be nice to get. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, HSAs and so buckets of, in this case, pre-tax money. So the IRS defined HSAs before direct primary care was around. Right. So uh, we asked the direct primary care coalition, the IRS, to update the language. And uh, I think the short answer was no. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, the steps as, as things move forward, the, uh, the bipartisan bill in the House that, that would update this language in that passed, I think it's currently in the Senate. So. As an American that has an HSA account, which hundreds of thousands of Americans do, you can use that HSA money to buy eyeglasses and uh, buy ibuprofen. You should be able to use that HSA money to pay for your direct primary care doctor, that membership. Uh, so, so that would be something that would be very useful, uh, and I believe that bill is in the Senate right now, to kind of clean up some language that will allow an American to use their HSA account to pay for direct primary care, uh, which would be a tremendous return on investment in many fronts. Yep. 
Yeah, so let me, let me make sure, because I'm not sure the audience, especially the, the television audience, may not be completely familiar with this. The key issue here with HSAs is that if you can't come up with a receipt for a specific service or a specific medical product, your HSA can't pay for it. Uh, uh, and what, what uh, uh, Clint is talking about is the ability to contract for a, a suite of potential services, uh, but not on a fee-for-service basis. Uh, that, that's a huge distinction. And once again, we have locked ourselves into this, this archaic way of thinking and an archaic way of, of acting. Yeah, so. oh, you, you had talked earlier well, just about employer, employee choice and defined contribution. So a number of employee, employers over the past 10 years have been experimenting with creating um, private exchanges. So mm -hmm. think of Obamacare exchange, but specifically for groups of employers. And we've had mixed results. Um, so we, we, we've given employ not our company, but um, employees are given a defined amount of money to spend per year, and they purchase um, um, a health plan through this exchange instead of being told here are your exact benefits. So um, you know the jury's still out in terms of is this actually driving better behavior? Um, are they creating market dynamics where they're shifting demand and are they saving money? So it's um, to be determined. But it's been a very slow adoption by employers. Uh, so um, you know, in the end, the age-old question is, um, what can the government do to either prevent disruption or maybe get out of the way and allow disruption to occur. So I'd be, I think we'd all be curious to know if you could pick out a couple of major issues that you either experienced or you're seeing ahead that uh, could be resolved, that could uh, lead to some progress uh, in getting consumers more involved with better decisions in their health care. I'll start by saying more telemedicine parity laws and reimbursements care that can be delivered virtually. Uh, you want to change the behavior of doctors and, and patients, you know, pay them for consulting remotely where it's where it makes sense. It'd be a great place to start. Yeah. Can you do can you do telemedicine in a fee for service setting? We do today. Yeah. But you have to get paid for yeah. it. You have to negotiate one off contracts with everyone yeah. to make yeah. it work, right? Yeah. Doctors have been doing yeah. telemedicine for decades and decades, right? You know, we all used to wear an old school pager. Uh, <laughs> and the challenge is in the fee for service world, you don't get paid for those visits. The state of Colorado has passed some legislation that's changed that here recently. Um, and so, so that's a, you know, you'll spend your whole day on the phone and then you can't pay your nurses and your staff. So you have to set up a business model that allows for that. Yeah. I think we have to work on the prices. So health systems have, amazing power for a couple of reasons. One is in, in the Medicare Advantage program and in the ACA programs. Uh, insurance companies have to have adequate networks in every county that they sell yeah. insurance in. And now that hospitals have employed many of the specialists, if you're gonna be network adequate, you often have to have mm -hmm. specific hospitals in them. And when they negotiate, they negotiate for the entire thing. And so even though it's only neurology where they have a monopoly, you have to take everything at whatever price they set it at. And that's led to things like the $6,000 average price of a hospital we pay in the Medicare program today. It, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and so we have to do something to think about how to create like a playing field. Because if, if Oscar wants to offer insurance or, or Devoted or any other company in many counties, you have to get a system to say yes. And if they don't say yes, you don't operate. Uh, and I've seen examples in the two insurance companies that, that I work in in counties where they don't actually offer coverage because the hospital said no. And they employed all the oncologists or all the neurologists or all the psychiatrists. So I think we have to think about how to think about hospital market power. And maybe it's above a certain percentage. You have you know, your critical access for insurance. So you have to actually offer a price that Medicare can say is a percent of Medicare. Uh, maybe it's say all payers can get the same price above a certain market share. Uh, so you can have competition. Uh, but there's something you, we, ha we need to do something about that hospital market power. The second thing we have to think about is drug prices. They're, they're growing even faster than hospital prices. And we don't have a way today to sort of negotiate because often there's only one drug in a class or there's, you know, there's variations in patients that make it such that I can't switch you all to one drug because it doesn't work for everybody. And, and we're learning more about personalization of medicines, but as we get more data from, from the genome on how to personalize medicines, we'll actually use more medicines, not fewer. Yeah. And that's problematic when it comes to negotiating for them. Uh, and then the third thing we, we need to do is um, 
I think, you know, change the malpractice system so that we can, you know, get doctors to stop sort of claiming that a bunch of their care is, you know, which I would say is wasteful, they would say is defensive, and, and go to something different. And whether that's, you know, pointing to evidence that you're following in a care plan um, or other systems, I, I think we can do a lot to make that a better process for everybody. Yeah, when it goes, Bob, it goes Bob's point on um, unit costs and, and pricing power of facilities in particular, uh, it is just, it bears repeating that um, there is this absurdity in the system right now where uh, employees in particular and, and commercial health insurers pay um, about upwards of 150% Medicare, oftentimes north of 200, 300%, 400% Medicare for facilities in particular. Um, what that effectively means is that healthcare might be the only place or the only industry where the government's a more efficient negotiator of service <laughs> pricing than, uh, than the private sector. Mm. And so that is really just a sort of like a bizarre outcome. Um, and it leads to all kinds of situations also then if you're a small insurance company going into a market of having sort of like to fight your way in there and really um, try, to, uh, try to find a health system that wants to work with you uh, because that system knows that in the end, if they do something that would start lowering perhaps these reimbursement rates at a, at a higher level, that would not be good for them in the, in the medium long term. I, I do really think personally, that we are encountering two types of hospital CEOs in these discussions. Um, there's one type of CEO who says, we tried all these things in the 1990s, it didn't work. Um, and you know, Jim I talked about this a bit earlier as well. I mean, that's a real talking point. You know, there were HMOs in the 90s, there were narrow networks in the 90s, you know, there were ACO types in the 90s, they had different names, but these models existed. And they say, you know, these things didn't work, and so therefore we don't ever need to think about network design any, ever again. Networks will always be broad, and, you know, get out of my office, or our inpatient beds are full. That's another classic. You know, when you hear somebody say that, that's also a classic of a uh, person we see saying, look, I'll charge you 400% Medicare and you can, you can leave. But there's another type of hospital CEO we're also encountering. And I think that's getting in the majority now that's saying, I feel the pinch in the market I'm in that I'm starting to get cut out of networks. And I realize I'm going to have to start competing on value and on unit costs. Um, and if you build a narrow network design with me, I will give you lower unit costs, um, and I will, uh, and we, we can build deep integrations, and we can make sure this is a great member experience at a lo at a lower cost. Uh, and that's really something that, that's something that's the strategy we've been we've been driving. We will make a network feel great and look great from a quality and access point of view um, if a health system is willing to go and give us a discount um, uh, and, and build a different kind of model with us. With the Cleveland Clinic, for example, which I'm sure you're familiar with, top system in the country, uh, we built a, a co-branded insurance plan called the Cleveland Clinic Oscar Insurance Plan. We share risk 50-50. So they're now really on the hook for making sure not everybody goes to their main campus with very high fee-for-service rates. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you immediately get the flu, you go into one of the community hospitals where even their kind of reimbursement rates are lower and it's even more efficient for them to deliver the care there. So that's really, I think, one big block and area we're going to work on. The second one is, um, this is again from the front lines, there are all kinds of uh, regulations across the country where I do think progress is slowed down at least. Um, I really do think that all the regulatory bodies we deal with, and I think I counted them, we have like 25 different regulators, you know, Adobe in New Jersey, DMHC in California, CMS, CSIO, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every, uh, across, across the country, all of them are one good public policy. They all want to protect the member. They all want to, they all, none of them likes the current healthcare system. None of them likes the current healthcare kind of like cost basis and things like that. Um, and so they're, they're good people to work with. But there are rules that were written a while ago that we don't mm -hmm. revisit quickly enough. Simple example is in Tennessee, where we offer plans in Nashville and small group and individual, uh, we can't in the small group markets offer free telemedicine, which we usually offer everywhere, even pre-deductible, um, in high deductible plans because there is some bizarre regulation yeah. that um, allows for no first dollar coverage of any kinds until you start, until you hit your deductible. Yeah, that's, that's a big problem because there's a bunch of things like preventive yeah. care that's not a preventive care visit that right. you can do that saves a bunch of money. And whether that's mental health screening, right. whether it's diabetes prevention, whether it's telemedicine, if you could take away the thousand dollar yeah. copay, people would actually do it, and it, it has an ROI this year. It has this year. Yeah. We we internally, for example, know that even if half of all the telemedicine visits that we have were excess induced demands, so you're on the couch, you got the flu, otherwise you wouldn't have gone anywhere. Now you're pushing a button, talking to a doctor. Right. Even if half of those were excess, we would still be taking cost out um, over MLR by making this all totally free. And then for some reason, in some states you still can't do it. Again, they're all learning, they're all adapting, and it's not because they, are, they don't believe in the fundamental principles of this, 
it just is a little slow sometimes in how this is changing. We got to make sure we keep pushing on that and put the data out there for people to see that it works. Two, two things that, that Medicare proposed that they may not succeed in actually getting implemented are site neutral payments and then coding simplification. So it is silly that when the hospital buys my practice, I'm not located at the hospital, I'm sitting where I was before yesterday, that suddenly my prices go up by 25%. And they can now pay me more because when they buy me, like they got more revenue, so they can induce me to sell. And for a patient, it's not any better or different, in fact, worse, because like now you get a letter mailed later from a billing agency you don't know. Right. Uh, and so that's silly. We, we, need to, we need to get rid of this asymmetry that we pay for the same stupid thing at a different site. It's, it's, it's terrible. The second thing that's really frustrating is that uh, Medicare courageously proposed saying we're going to pay one price for a new patient and one price for a follow-up patient visit. It's going to be fine. And they average it to be like a level 3.5 visit. Mm -hmm. And as a doctor who's been reminded by coding, chart reading coding people that I need to write more stuff down about your review of systems and your yeah. family history to get paid more, it's silly. We write eight page notes for 15 minute visits for people when they come and see us for ear infection, all for codings, so we can say it's a level four, not a level three. Medicare said, so let's get rid of all that. And what, what happened? The doctors didn't go, hallelujah, because they have been saying they hate coding and charting and the computer time. They said, no, 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 keep it how it is, because we've gained it so much that we're making more money by upcoding. And so we got to get rid of that. We need to have a code, and it should be a, pay, a price for a visit. Similarly, we have this thing called risk adjustment coding in the ACA and in Medicare Advantage. It is, it's, it's a terrible thing, because it makes me write down every year every diagnosis that you might have had, mm -hmm. and diseases that really aren't your main problem. Because everything I write down makes me get paid more money, and now there's a whole industrial complex that's mining charts, faxing requests to me, saying, please, doctor, send me a chart. Medicare Advantage Insurance can get 80% or so of every chart from every member every year, and they send them to people or machines to go try to find every time there was something written that I, or something recorded that I didn't call a disease to make me write it down so they get paid more. It can be done differently and by a computer. We should get rid of the RAF coding system. We take out $3 billion of people doing that. Just that. And, and so when I look at healthcare administration in America, I mean, Mario's right, like 22 regulators, and they all kind of have good, good intentions, but like we need a lot less of the administrative stuff. Like, like we spend $3.3 trillion, but like we spend $800 billion on administrative cost. Like, like that's what we can get rid of. We don't have to like ration the medicines. We can like get rid of the fax machines. But every time we try, the system says, no, 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 I keep it. And, and we need to sort of break through that. So to Bob's point, uh, and a lot of patients don't necessarily realize this when they're getting their care. So there's coding. So there's the International Classification of Disease States, ICD-9, which I memorized a lot of those codes younger in my career. And then and all of a sudden, those 10,000 codes went to about 70,000 codes with ICD-10. Mm -hmm. So now when you, know, you slip and fall, uh, it's not just slip and fall in one coat. It's slip and fall left leg, slip and fall off a curb, slip and fall off a roller coaster, slip and fall off a, the list goes on, right? And then I'm paid based upon the way I code, right? That is nuts. That is crazy. And I'm not a data entry specialist. I'm, I want to take care of my patients, but I have to figure out, wait, wait a minute, did she fall off the roller coaster or did she fall off the curb, right? And then I have to bill, well, my gosh, it's a shorter visit. Do I bill a 99213 or do I bill a 99214? I'll get paid more on a 99214. And oh my gosh, she has a skin take. She wants to have frozen off with some cryogen. Should I bill that CPT code for that? You guys, that's 30 to 50% of a primary care doctor's day in the fever service world. And they don't like that. They just want to take care of patients. So we take care of patients and remove that mess. And now you go from seeing 30 patients a day and trying to, this crazy behavior of how am I going to code and bill and then you know, having dinner with your kids and spending another hour or two at night coding and billing, right? Uh, you remove that and you spend time with the patient, 30 minutes to 60 minutes of time. And it creates this relationship. And oh, by the way, the patient's not coming back to you a month or two later after they get this crazy looking EOB this bill saying, oh, doctor, you, char you coded wrong. So, so, you know, there are these pieces that are set up, and you hear the word data, and you hear the word analytics. There are a lot of people that work in that data analytics system, and it is an archaic, old, crazy system. So, so that needs to be, you mentioned things getting out of the way. That's just get the bulldozer out and clean yeah, that but, up. But what's funny is you're a doctor saying what you just said, which most doctors say, but every single doctor association came out against actually the coding changes. 
And so uh, that's, that speaks mm -hmm. to sort of the problem. So there are perverse incentives in this dysfunctional healthcare <laughs> ecosystem, and a lot of people want to keep things the same because they make a lot of money off of coding and education, uncoding, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not saying that we have the perfect system, but what I'm saying is that in the doctor's day is tremendously frustrating. Uh, and it takes up way too much time that takes away from patient care. So we need to stop pecking for payment. Well, we're talking about coding. That is definitely a fantastic topic. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, actually, to connect this back to what we talked about a bit earlier, the long-term investments into patients' health, um, the other issue with the current coding system, again, is that all the that the code, that the, the reimbursement settlements that happen between the insurance companies or the insurer and the governments happen within a 12-month period. And so there, there, again, insurers don't really have, and, and sometimes even doctors who do the coding and get paid for the coding, don't have an incentive to really sort of like invest in long-term health. Um, Truvada and, and PrEP is a great example for that. So um, PrEP, uh, when you take antiretroviral drugs nowadays, um, it really does stop the spread of HIV. It's a fantastic thing for society. It's great for individuals as well. Um, the problem, one problem is crazy high drug costs cost 25,000 bucks a year for us to pay for somebody's Truvada because there was a patent fight going on between Gilead and others, whatever else. That's one of those murky drug company kind of things. Um, but the other thing also is, from a coding perspective, these are healthy members taking a $25,000 drug to prevent from getting sick. For, that means for the doctor coding that patient, for the insurance company managing that patient, there is no reimbursement of that risk effectively that you mitigate it. If we were able to get a coding system in place that sort of like um, uh, says to the doctor, says to the insurance company, whatever you did this year and whatever contributes to the patient's health over like a 10-year time period or so, you can start earning a return on that essentially even if the patient starts moving on through the system. And, and you can start trailing returns there. That would be fantastic to somehow build. That would, I think, again, um, make uh, actors in the healthcare system want to invest in your health, in your longer-term health, in, in, in much more of a different way and get the intentions of that in place than is the case today. Right. Uh, we need to go to the audience. I'll just point out that that's not a coding issue. Uh, that's a fundamental issue of uh, uh, the financial arrangements in the health system. Um, uh, Hassan, you look like you want to say something. But no, just, so going back to the demand side, I'm spending a lot of time working with employees, trying to get them to go to the right place, um, get their physicals and do other things. But you've heard for the past 15 minutes on the supply side, there, the headwinds that employers facing, and we're paying for half the medical bills in this country, um, are tremendous. And our suppliers are not hospitals and doctors. Our suppliers are insurance companies. So we're looking to them for solutions and innovation and helping us actually go out and purchase better health care. Fortunately, there's always somebody else to say, well, it's their job. Uh, <laughs> uh, why don't we uh, go to the audience? And uh, um, uh, there's a microphone. Uh, why don't we start here and work our way around the room? Please identify uh, yourself and uh, uh, try to make it a brief question. I will try to be brief. Uh, Lou Gagliano, Coalition to Transform Advanced Care. Uh, I agree with Bob. This is a, an exciting time and things are changing, and I want to talk about two things that I think are important, the ACO model and value-based contracting. And the reason I think they're important is that, that we're, they, they both aim at keeping, uh, uh, delivering effective health care longer term in the ACO model shorter term and point to where more effective clinically proved care is going. So I'd like everybody's perspective of how that's changed, how you're doing your business. I can start from here. Very simple. We try to seek out physician groups that are organizing differently and try to work with those in different capacity. I mean, for example, I would love to find a way to start reimbursing direct primary care practices that we could then integrate more deeply with from a technology perspective. So we're seeking out those people who are, do, who are transforming their practice this way, and I think it's, it's a great trend. We're trying to invest in more groups like that. One of our portfolio companies is called Allidate, and they go to independent doctors, one, two, three, four doctor groups are their largest sort of segment, and they say, join us. We'll do all that administrative stuff to get you to be eligible. We'll collect all the data. We'll give you the analytics. We can't do it as a one doctor group. And, and we'll aggregate the lives so we're big enough to actually be in the program and we'll help them mitigate their risk by put, putting them in bigger pools. And we've seen amazing growth. Uh, they now have about 2,000 doctors in 37 states and 400,000 Medicare ACO yeah. participants. And, and, and the doctors, like, they like it better because when you tell a doctor, your job now is not to figure out like, the most optimal way to code. In fact, <laughs> coding in the native way is actually better for us. Um, 
In fact, your job is to think about all the things you can do to help that patient not ever need somebody downstream. It, it, doctors are able to adapt very quickly, and, and, the, and the patients and the doctors both do better. And patients in those practices are, are happier, so they, don't, mm -hmm. they tend to not leave and, and change doctors as often. So you can do things that, that prevent care. Uh, and we're finding things like Devoted Health, which is an insurance company that is so predicated upon finding doctors that are of that type and then giving them contracts to help them actually grow their practice and drive patients into those practices. Uh, and we're not alone. There, there's, I think, a tremendous amount of capital and interest going into actually creating new supply that actually benefits from these changes in, in incentives and information. Right. It's a source of demand for telemedicine, yeah. I'll say. Um, yeah. With that type of payment model now, those physician groups have an incentive to keep patients at home and treat them through telemedicine if they can. Uh, in some cases, they may not have access to psychiatrists. So they'll work with us to fill a gap in a provider class that they don't have on site. So it's, it's definitely a good thing for our type of business. I mean, Kaiser, who you know, is like the, the old version of, of this idea, um, they do more than half of their visits now over telemedicine or asynchronously. And I mean, and, and you have some more data that says like, what, two thirds of your members use telemedicine during oh, the year. routine conditions. Yeah, and so if you pay differently, the supply side actually adapts pretty quickly. You yeah. mentioned ACO, so you know how do you improve upon that? You, you have how is that ACO set up from a business structure? And and I would say if, if it's a physician a, physician led ACO, it's probably going to do better. And if it's a DPC ACO physician led, then that might even do a little bit better. And there are some DPC ACOs now. Uh, just okay. uh, employers are continually pushing the health plans to go out and find value pay, value based arrangements. Um, working with ACOs the right way and making sure that um, they're actually driving value for us. So. Okay, I think we're going to be able to get another question in. Uh, my name is Bonnie Wachtel. I approach the uh, subject matter as an investor and consumer. I was very struck, maybe as a person who's getting to an age where cancer is more of a risk, by the comment that if the health provider could invest in you for 10 years, knew they would have you for 10 years, they could do things like analyze your genome and work from that for better care. So is it an innovation worth fighting for to allow patients to sign up for multi-year contracts directly incented by something along the lines of we're going to analyze your genome, or you could use your HSA funds to analyze your genome, and while you're thinking about that, does it make sense for a relatively healthy 60-year-old person to pay themselves to have their genome analyzed and attached to their health record? And by the way, how much does it cost to have your genome analyzed? <laughs> so so from, from the doctoring lane there, uh, we don't need to analyze your genome. You know, if you have a primary care doctor, it will make an impact on your morbidity and your mortality. And that there's data out there supporting that, even in the fee-for-service world, that if you have a primary care doctor, it impacts your morbidity, mortality, and your spend over a lifetime. Now, if you take that and make that a direct primary care doctor, you just up the ante a little bit. And so I don't need your genome, but what I do need is I need a relationship, time, and trust. And so I can, you unleash me to do that, and we can now do proactive preventative care. And all that talking that we'll have and all that time that we'll spend, there's no ICD-10 code for healthy. We have 70,000 codes, and I can't bill <laughs> for all the time that I'm going to spend with you to talk about health, wellness, proactive, preventive cancer screenings, right? And, and, and we do genetic analysis at Nextera Healthcare, but, but we don't need that to, to make a difference on things like obesity and diabetes and heart attacks and strokes, et cetera, et cetera. So should you be able to use your HSA money to pay for genome sequencing? I think you can do that now. We have patients doing it. Hopefully it's legal, um, uh, number one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so should you be able to use uh, funds to be able to have a direct primary care doctor? For sure, whether they're your own, whether that's your own money, your employer's money, or whether that's your HSA account, we definitely believe you should be able to do that. Give it's you, America. Yeah. Give you one concrete tip on this one. I think it's an emerging science, obviously emerging fields, um, and I would agree with the comment for sure. There are many other things the PCP can do already for you to make sure you stay healthy. But here's one thing you can do if you go to 23andMe, for example, or anybody else out there that sequences your genome, they can do it for 100 bucks or so. It will cost them probably like 10 or $15 at this point through the actual sequencing. Uh, there's an app uh, created by Dr. Eric Topol in San Diego who's been looking at a thing called polygenic risk scores where they take you, you the data from 23andMe and they can categorize you now, for example, in terms of your risk expressed by your genome 
um, that you will develop cardiovascular disease. Uh, and if you're in the top like five or 10, 10 percentile or so there, you have such an increased risk of even if you're 40 years old, you start taking statins. Um, there's some, but, but these sort of like care pathways mm-hmm. tied to polygenic risk scores is literally the literature has started to come out in the last, I'd say, two or three years or so. So it's relatively novel, but you'll start seeing more along those lines, I think. So right now, we've got the good, the, the good old world working pretty well, but there's some cool new stuff happening that I think is worth watching. I did 23 Me, and it's fascinating, and it's worth doing. It's kind of entertainment. It might be also very useful. It's 100 bucks, so you can afford it. Yeah. Um, I would say, though, your idea of a multi-year health insurance benefit is a very interesting and interesting, I think important yeah. idea to study. Yeah. Um, the state of Valencia, Spain, is the best example of this in the world. They did a 25-year contract with an insurance company called Bupa. When you sign up, you say the whole state. You get everybody for 25 years, and Bupa was in charge of the health care delivery. When you have that horizon, you do a bunch of different things. So you invest in sidewalks, in farmer's markets, in primary care, in making flu shots everywhere. Uh, you give out a bunch of the medicines for free with no copay because that horizon is very, very long. In 25 years, is probably longer than you need. Uh, but you can imagine if, if you had somebody in a five or 10 year plan, you would have a very different set of things that actually your insurance company would offer you and it would make you healthier. It'd be much more economically advantageous for everybody to make you healthier if we had you longer. You need consumer protection so you didn't, you know, somebody got bought the wrong thing or, or moved away. Or you have to have some ways to get them out so there's some thoughtfulness about how you design it, but it would be very helpful. The state of Nebraska is, uh, for its employees for the next four years, I believe, uh, investing in direct primary care. The company is Strata Healthcare, and they have a contract with the state of Nebraska to provide uh, direct primary care to the employees uh, for the next four years, I believe. The state of New Jersey, uh, through, I believe, Our Health and Paladina Health, uh, is offering direct primary care to its employees in a long-term investment. And, so, and you need that in the primary care setting. It's not a one-year experiment. It's two, three, four years, right? Uh, it doesn't happen in three to six months. And so, so you see states across the country that are saying, hey, we see this as a solution and we're willing to take our funds that uh, pay for care or coverage and invest in direct primary care for our state employees. Okay. Um, well, all I can say is if you think you might have a criminal in your uh, uh, gene <laughs> sequence somewhere, you probably don't want to do it unless you really don't like the guy. Um, yes. Oh, wait for the, uh, the uh, microphone. Yeah. Katie Caps with Health Show Resources. I have a question as it relates to what the market did maybe 20 years ago, and um, particularly from an employer standpoint. You know, there's a development of all sorts of commercial health management and um, disease management type firms because the primary care system was not satisfactory to many employers as it relates to managing chronic conditions and multiple chronic conditions. So employers started hiring uh, commercial disease management firms and then it led into health management firms and then population health management firms. So I'm interested in your perspective of what you're seeing the market do today in terms, and a limitation of that of course was it did not integrate into the medical model. And since it didn't integrate into the medical model, you, you didn't have downstream risk managed necessarily appropriately. I'm interested in hearing from an employer standpoint if you're seeing a a difference in what you have access to today and then from the rest of you how those activities have merged into what we call more of the medical model which is also expanded. So So I'll start. Um, We do we have access to dozens and dozens of uh, companies probably hundreds actually that are are willing to help us manage the risk of our employees. Disease management companies are more um, kind of important for self-insured employers like ourselves, where we're bearing 100% of the risk. And the reason we started hiring them 20 years ago is because the health plans said, well, you're self-insured, you take care of it. And so employers are out looking for and curating solutions like disease management. And I have I have a number of them for our employees right now, and they are working. But you, you, you echo a point I brought up earlier, that they are sitting siloed. They, are, they have no risk. Um, they're trying to work between PBMs, physicians, ACOs, and um, you know, I don't, I don't have everyone at the table at the same time, and so I'm, I'm, it's, it's more directed towards the consumer and actually getting them more engaged in their health. It's not actually helping on the supply side. Okay. Well, uh, why don't we wrap this up? I'd make a, kind of a final comment, uh, which is. Uh, 
the, uh, the market is changing, not just the healthcare market, the employer market. Uh, to some extent, the problems that we see now will be replaced by other problems 20 years from now, but it is absolutely a fact that many of the things that our panelists talked about today are reflecting a change in, I think, consumer perspectives about how they want their, how they want to get their health care, how they want to pay for their health care, and what, and what they expect from their health care. Uh, the old model um, uh, is, is phasing out. There is a new model coming. I think we see some examples here. Uh, but certainly the idea, I like the slide that, that showed the waiting room, the idea of sitting in a waiting room for 45 minutes to pick up somebody else's disease. Yeah, <laughs> it is true that young people don't like that, but us old people don't like it either. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, please uh, thank our panel for a great discussion. Oh. Appreciate the opportunity, Jim. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh.